Right. So thank you all for coming today. We're really excited to be celebrating the launch of this new center on campus with all of you. Um, the center was really a collaboration among faculty um, across different parts of campus. And I think we're trying to model it on a lot of what we did in the process of developing this, which is cross communication between sciences, philosophy, uh, law, and different kinds of public and stakeholder engagement. So we're excited to have you all here. Um, we're going to have this program, which is composed of faculty that are already a part of the center to try and give you a little taste of what it is that we're doing here and the ideas that we're bringing with the center. And we really invite you all um, to collaborate with us and to join us in this effort. Um, we're looking for collaborators for potential fellows. You'll hear more about our postdoc and graduate student fellows at the end. Um, but we'll have chances for questions along the way. And then we hope you all can stay for lunch. We're going to have lunch outside. Um, it's hopefully going to be a relatively nice day. Not as hot as yesterday, but it'll be nice. So to kick us off, um, we have the former UC Berkeley Vice Chancellor for Research, Randy Katz. Um, he is going to be speaking to us via Zoom, so I'm going to attempt to get that up now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lee, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you particularly for giving me the opportunity to comment on the launch of this new and exciting center. Um, I cannot think of a better time or place to launch such a center. In the 21st century, science and technology are causing us, yet again, to rethink the relationship between knowledge and civilization for good and for bad. As T.S. Eliot so knowingly wrote almost 100 years ago, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Artificial intelligence algorithms make decisions that affect our daily lives. How are those decisions made? Are they fair? And are they compatible with our values? Editing the genome is possible to prevent disease or to create the so-called perfect child. What does it mean to rewrite the rules of nature? And what are the implications for life on the planet? Neuroscience allows us to understand the mind, certainly the most complex machine in existence. Can we use that understanding to accelerate things like learning or to implant new thoughts or read people's minds? And should we? How can we better engage the public on prospects and consequences of these new breakthroughs? History is full of unintended consequences. Are we now wise enough to prepare ourselves to avoid these missteps or better recover from them? Berkeley is not just a leader in scientific endeavors. It leads in the scholarship of the social sciences and the humanities, and in the education of professionals in journalism, public policy, business, and law. All have a critically important role to play in preparing society for this new Promethean age. I especially want to thank those who have worked so hard to bring this exciting new endeavor to Berkeley through a highly competitive process overseen by the Kavli Foundation. Nobel laureates, Jennifer Doudna and Saul Perlmutter, and a distinguished set of faculty members, uh, including Elena Konis, Jack Gallant, Jody Halpern, and Jay Wallace, led ably by Professor Stuart Russell and Dr. Lee Witkowski as the center's founding leadership team. And with the support of Dr. Kaya Sert, and the team from the Vice Chancellor for Research Office and Sylvia Beerhouse of the Campus Development Office. Chancellor Carol Christ has been instrumental in providing her enthusiastic support throughout the, the process. I wish to acknowledge Dr. Robert Kahn, former president of the Kavli Foundation for his vision and encouragement and for the current president, Dr. Cynthia Friend for her continued support. Brooke Smith of the Kavli Foundation was incredibly helpful and supportive through the pre-proposal, proposal, and final award processes. And with that, I'd like to turn the program back to Stuart to lead us through the rest of the day. Thank you all.
Uh, first of all, why do we need this center? So I'm going to give my own personal opinion, um, which is pretty simple, that uh, we are at the point now where science fairly regularly uh, is uh, making breakthroughs or promising breakthroughs that can bring change uh, really at a global uh, species level, uh, both positive and potentially negative. Um, we've seen two technologies that have already done this in the past, one being nuclear technology and the other one being the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and I would say we've survived nuclear technology by the skin of our teeth on multiple occasions. Um, I think this is really proof of the multiverse theory, uh, which says we just happen to be in the, in the, the universe where we did survive and all, and all the other ones we didn't. Um, and, uh, you know, fossil fuels, I would say, we, maybe we've lost that battle. So we'll see. Um, these things are happening more and more quickly. And my goal in setting, in setting up this center uh, is to try to help get the next few decades right, that we don't make the same kinds of mistakes that we've made with these, um, with these other technologies. But getting the next decade right means we have to have a meaning for the word right. And as we'll see in many of the presentations today, uh, that's a very contested question. Um, and it's not up to us to decide what's right. Uh, and so it's, it's really up to the human race to decide what's right. Uh, so these are the three questions that we're going to uh, organize our research around. So first of all, understanding uh, what does the human race mean by getting the next few decades right? What are the interests that are affected? Uh, and what obligations do those interests put on us uh, as scientific researchers and philosophers and ethicists and lawyers and so on? Um, we also need to understand how uh, science and, te and technology are going to develop in future. Um, and that may include uh, adding areas beyond the ones that we've, uh, that we've already uh, listed, um, AI, gene editing, and uh, neurotechnology. Um, and then we want to actually affect change. I think this is a sort of Berkeley tradition. Uh, we're not just an ivory tower. We actually want to get out there and make the world a better place. And so uh, for science and technology, that may mean uh, affecting public policy. It may mean affecting how science even thinks of itself and you know, what, is, what does it mean to get up and be a scientist of type X every day, right? Uh, if we can change that, then we may not need, uh, you know, such uh, drastic changes in public policy. Uh, and we don't need to be so concerned about the risks if scientists will take that on board in what they actually do every day. So here's the structure of the center. Uh, this is really the only reason I have PowerPoint, so I can show you this picture. Uh, which we, uh, and I think this isn't the latest one actually, Lee has been refining it still further, but I forgot to put the new one in, but we've been refining this picture over and over. So the idea of, of hub and spoke is pretty common, but it sort of also brings into mind a wheel spinning by itself. Uh, so we wanted to have an axle, which is what connects the wheel uh, to actually, you know, forward motion that bring up uh, difficult questions. Um, the hub is where those are discussed between the scientists and the philosophers and the lawyers and public policy experts and journalists and so on. Um, so the axle is what drives change in the world and also connects the wheel, the hub, the spokes, uh, to the public, to all the stakeholders, to the, uh, the you know, ordinary people and their interests in the future and so on. So this is really uh, a cross-campus effort. Um, I think we're potentially including more than half of the departments on campus uh, in what we're doing here. Um, so just very briefly, I'll go through each, of, each part of this. So the hub, as I said, is, is where the philosophers, the ethicists, and so on work with uh, the scientists and then uh, with the public. Uh, to figure out answers to some of these core questions, or at least, you know, this is where I, 
disagree with the philosophers or the philosophers disagree with me. You know, philosophers are quite happy for questions not to be answered for actually thousands of years, um, and that's fine. Uh, and I, I can see that perspective. Uh, you know, as an AI researcher, I'm worried that if we don't answer these questions, then the AI systems will answer them for us, not in the sense of solving the problem, but actually just implementing some uh, unsuspected solution uh, that may not be the one that we want. Um, so there's uh, here are just some of the people who uh, who have, uh, in some sense, signed up to be part of this effort uh, in the hub, in uh, primarily in philosophy, but also in other areas, politics and law and so on. Um, so the Axel makes this uh, connection between uh, the sort of academic core and, and the real world concerns. And if you, if you take a kind of, maybe this is a 19th century view of science, right? That you know, knowledge is just good right? in the worst case. And this is actually you know, a theorem in, uh, in decision theory, right? That the expected value of information is non-negative. And, and how do you prove that theorem? You simply say, well, if you don't like what you find, don't do anything with it, right? Um, and so, uh, so from that point of view, right, all knowledge is good because you know there's good new things we can do with it, and you know if there are bad things we can do with it, we won't do the bad things, and so that's all fine, right? But obviously, the world is not ideal, um, and all of this really is around the non-ideality of the world. Um, and you can think of this in two ways. One is uh, making science safer for the world, meaning scientists refrain from doing things that uh, are very likely in practice in the world as it is to lead to negative outcomes. Right? So uh, one example that I sometimes use, particularly when scientists tell me, as they often do, uh, that they shouldn't be involved in policy, that all they do is produce new knowledge, it's entirely up to other people to use that knowledge as they see fit, right? Um, and that's the democratic process. Uh, that was the argument used by the scientists who produced Zyklon B, uh, the gas used in the gas chambers uh, in the Second World War. Um, they were the first people to be executed in the Nuremberg trials. So that argument didn't go very far. Uh, and I don't think it should go very far in the way we think about our responsibilities as scientists. We have to take into account the fact that we actually work in the world as it is. Um, but we could also uh, change the way the world works, maybe for the better, um, so that when new knowledge is produced that, that has nefarious uses, it's less likely to get used in that way. And that makes the world a safer place to do science because it's not always possible to tell what, what your science is going to produce. Uh, and you need, you need that freedom in order to make progress. Um, there's also uh, a number of issues around public perception, particularly today, uh, where uh, science is becoming associated with one particular political party in the U.S. Uh, and um, uh, and, and uh, blamed by the other party for all kinds of things. Um, and then, uh, you know, how if you've ever worked in public policy uh, on scientific questions, it's an extremely difficult process. Uh, most of these questions are not uh, bread and butter questions that are going to affect constituents uh, in the next few months. This process of affecting public policy uh, and how science is governed uh, is a really difficult uh, and complicated one. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, one of the primary functions of this axle is to bring in the concerns uh, that uh, human stakeholders have uh, around the scientific questions. And so this includes uh, the deans of all the professional schools who wrote wonderful letters uh, supporting the proposal, um, but also people in other departments, sociology, political science, and so on, um, that, that deal with uh, the world as it really is. Um, and now we have the three spokes. We already talked about uh, genome editing, uh, the question, you know, do we want to have uh, enhanced genetic enhancement of our children? Uh, and the, the specter of eugenics, um, but even questions like, you know, as we ad maybe adapt to space habitats or colonizing Mars, we may end up creating actually new species of humans. How do we feel about that? Um, and those are interesting kinds of questions. 
uh, in neuroscience, um, the technology uh, is moving ahead quite rapidly. Um, and we may soon see the capability for uh, technological enhancement of mental capabilities. Uh, and then, you know, if that becomes, you know, we've got rid of the SATs, if you replace that with, you know, uh, what, what grade of neural enhancement have you had uh, in order to get into our program, uh, then we're out of the frying pan into the fire. Um, privacy, uh, you know, what happens if we can actually uh, join minds together uh, into uh, a sort of a unified Borg consciousness, uh, all these kinds of issues we are just beginning to go through. And then with AI, um, there are many, many questions. I'll talk about some of them. Uh, what happens uh, if humans become mostly redundant in our civilization uh, and there's no longer even a need for the next generation of humans to know how to run the civilization that we live in? Um, and what happens if we lose control altogether? Um, then we could also talk about other spokes that we, uh, we could add in. And this will be one of the processes we engage in all the time uh, is to think about what else is on the horizon, what else do we need to worry about. Um, one of the people we talked to uh, raised the issue of what happens as we move out from the Earth uh, into space and all the kinds of, of legal questions, of philosophical, biological questions that uh, that brings up. Uh, other people said, what about climate engineering? Like, how do we even decide uh, who gets to do it and, uh, and whether it gets done? Uh, and does it actually make the problem worse in the sense of then making it easier for us to continue pumping out carbon dioxide? Um, so we're running the air conditioning and the heating system at the same time, um, or whatever other field people want to talk about. So there are tons and tons of uh, faculty members who are excited and, and um, would like to be involved in this. Uh, and so that creates an enormous opportunity for students to get engaged uh, with their existing advisor, but uh, then starting to participate in the life of the center. So those are the gene editing people, these are the neuroscientists, these are the AI faculty. Um, and across all these folks, there are many, many issues that are the same. And this is one of the reasons why we want to have the center uh, is to bring people together who unknowingly share the same kinds of ethical issues at, at, at some level of abstraction. Um, so for example, just to pick one, uh, present versus future generations, right? something that philosophers have talked about for a long time and economists have talked about for a long time. Um, and obviously this has um, a presence in uh, the geno genome editing and in AI uh, when we think about how AI systems make decisions. Uh, plasticity of human preferences is another one. Right? For you know, genome editing, do we ask us, whether we want our great-grandchildren to have two heads, or do we ask our great-grandchildren whether they like having two heads? And of course, they're going to say, well, I don't know how you guys got by with one, right? Of course we want to have two heads, right? But we might now think this is a, a really undesirable feature for the human race. Um, so there's lots of things that will go on. Uh, hopefully, this center will be a hive of activity. The core of it is going to be, obviously, the students and postdocs. Uh, who, let's face it, do the real work uh, on the campus. And um, so we'll be offering uh, fellowships, as many as we can afford. Uh, we'll develop courses. Uh, we will look at, on a regular basis, other areas of science and technology uh, to anticipate risks. Um, we'll have all kinds of uh, joint activities, uh, seminars, conferences, retreats, uh, if we can afford it, uh, visitor programs that may, when we bring people to campus for six months at a time uh, in fairly large numbers to work on important questions together in the way that, for example, the Simons Institute does in theoretical computer science. Uh, and these are very, very effective uh, kinds of programs. Um, and then we'll actually be trying to change the world for the better. We also have to actually raise some money. So I want to mention that at the end. Um, and I'm happy to announce that the, uh, the DALHAP Foundation, uh, DALHAP stands for Do As Little Harm As Possible. Uh, I thought it was some Swiss hedge fund, but no, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually a, uh, a, a, a very well-meaning foundation. So DALHAP Foundation has, has already agreed to provide 
five hundred thousand dollars in matching funds. Uh, the center. And with that, we'll uh, let, uh, Okay, so I think my brief here is to say something about the sort of questions that philosophers ask, uh, and then to illustrate how some of those questions might have a bearing on one or more of the spokes of um, the Kavli Center. So among the questions that philosophers ask are, what is happiness? What is well-being? What is the good life for a person? When does a person's life go well for them? Um, what would you want for someone you love, say your child, for their own sake? Those are all different ways of asking the same sort of question. And one answer to that question is given by what might be called hedonism. And hedonism says that the good life for a person consists in their experiencing sensations of pleasure, and they're not experiencing sensations of pain. So this was famously Jeremy Bentham's answer in the 18th century. Um, but among other worries about hedonism, the view might seem unduly narrow because it seems that we care about other things in our lives besides simply the experience of pleasure. Well, another answer is what we might call the objective list theory of well-being, which says that someone's life goes well for them to the extent that they have meaningful relationships with other people, to the extent that they have worthwhile um, achievements, that they engage in valuable activities, that they make autonomous choices, and so on. So the rough idea is there's sort of a list of goods, and your life goes well insofar as your life contains the goods on the list. And that's very roughly Aristotle's answer to the question. Now, a lot of people recoil from the objective list theory because they think, how could there be a fact of the matter whether or not mud wrestling is more or less valuable than chamber music? I mean, if someone enjoys, gets more pleasure out of mud wrestling, um, or if someone prefers mud wrestling to chamber music, then who are we to second guess them? So a third answer we might call um, just the preference satisfaction theory. Uh, and the preference satisfaction theory says that someone's life goes well, very simply, insofar as their preferences, roughly speaking, their desires, are satisfied. Now, that view avoids the narrowness of hedonism because you can prefer things other than the experience of pleasure. And it also seems to avoid the snobbery or at least controversy of the objective list theory because it makes each person through their preferences, the judge of what makes their life go well for them. So is the preference satisfaction theory of well-being the right way to go? Well, here's at least a puzzle for the preference satisfaction theory. So as a child, I preferred that as an adult, when I finally had the means, that I would spend all my money on toys and candy. But now, as an adult, I don't prefer it. Okay. So we have two conflicting preferences for what happens at the same time. So the preference I had as a child for what happens to me now, and the preference I have now for what happens to me now. So the question is, the satisfaction of which preference contributes to my well-being? Is it satisfaction of the preference I had as a child, or is it the satisfaction of the preference I have now, or in some sense, the satisfaction of both preferences? So in what we might call the time of satisfaction view, um, we privilege the preference that I have now. The idea is that concerning preferences for what happens at a given time, t, the preferences that matter are the preferences that are held at time t. So my preferences that I hold as an adult for what happens to me as an adult are the relevant preferences. And we ignore, plausibly enough, the preferences that I had as a child. An alternative, perhaps more ecumenical view, is what we might call the every moment view, which says the satisfaction of a preference at any moment in my life contributes other things equal to my well-being. So if I get the comic books and toys and candy right now, that will satisfy 
a preference that I had as a child, and that will contribute other things equal to my well-being. Now, if we have conflicts between preferences, as we do in this case, because I have a preference as an adult for things other than toys and candy, and I have a preference as a child for toys and candy, what we do is we try to satisfy the greatest number of preferences, assuming that somehow the preferences are of the same intensity. It even makes sense to talk about the intensity. So on that sort of thing, we get a kind of odd consequence. So in early adulthood, I've had all this childhood of wanting toys and candy as an adult. Right? So there are lots of preferences that are going to be satisfied by giving me the toys and candy now. And only a short period of adulthood in which I've wanted something else. So the worry is that I, as an adult, might be outvoted by myself as a child, that actually about, um, my, uh, <laughs> my, um, uh, my well-being will be promoted overall by satisfying the preferences that I had as a child. Okay, so this abstract and admittedly quirky discussion, <laughs> I think, actually does have some bearing on uh, a question that's asked by people who are concerned about long-term AI safety. Or at least it's a concern that I've heard raised when I've had conversations with the incredibly smart and curious and open-minded people at the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence that um, Professor um, Russell runs. And this question is, if we give AI the objective of satisfying our preferences, then perhaps AI will modify our preferences to make them easier to satisfy, right? So suppose that AI realizes that the most efficient way to satisfy our preferences is to give us preferences for sitting in darkened cells and drinking soylent. Suppose that that was just the most cost-effective way of satisfying our preferences then if all we've told AI is satisfy our preferences, the worry is that AI might um, satisfy our preferences by giving us these preferences for soylent and sitting in dark cells and then very cost-effectively satisfy those preferences. Now that seems like a nightmare scenario. It seems like something we don't want to happen. But the question for the rest of this talk is, can we explain why this is something that we don't want to happen on the preference satisfaction theory of well-being. That is, can we explain, according to the preference satisfaction theory, without reverting to hedonism or without reverting to the objective list theory, can we explain why it is that AI would not, in fact, be promoting our well-being by satisfying these modified preferences? for darkened cells and so I, Now it's hard to see how the preference satisfaction theory can explain this if we take the time of satisfaction view. Now, because the time of satisfaction view says that concerning preferences for what happens to me at a given time t, the preferences that matter are the preferences that I hold at time t. But then after the modification, right, the preferences that we have for what happens to us after the modification um, are uh, the preference, I mean, the preferences that we hold after the modification for what happens after the modification turn out to be the relevant preferences to satisfy, right? which would mean that in the nightmare scenario, AI is in fact satisfying our preferences. It is in fact um, promoting our well being. Well, a natural response to that is to say, well, but we prefer right now that AI in the future not modify our preferences. So if AI modifies our preferences, it's not satisfying the preferences that we have right now. I mean, the preferences that AI not in the future satisfy our modified preferences. But it seems like that view only gets traction on something like the every moment theory. And earlier, we found the every moment theory to be, to lead to a kind of absurd conclusion, right? I mean, we said that 
my preferences as a child for what happens to me as an adult shouldn't have any bearing on what promotes my well-being. But if that's true, then why should our preferences now for what happens to us in the future have any bearing on what promotes our well-being? Another worry is just that we might be outvoted by the future. That is, our preferences after the modification, for what happens after the modification, we might have more preferences that are satisfied by giving us the soylent and the darkened cells. Um, if the time after the modification is longer than the time before the modification, where we prefer something else. Again, the worry is that on the every moment view, we might just be outvoted by the future. Okay. Well, another response is to say, yeah, but it, it's not as though um, we should, according to the preference satisfaction theory, we should satisfy any old preference, right? The preferences whose satisfaction contributes to our well being are preferences for the right sort of thing. So the impulse here is to say, like, darkened cells and soylent is no way to live. But then what um, is the right sort of thing to prefer, right? If we say that the problem is that AI is modifying our preferences, so we prefer um, what gives us less pleasure over what gives us more pleasure, then the worry is that we're kind of reverting back to hedonism. If instead we say that the problem is that AI might modify our preferences so we prefer less valuable things to more valuable things, then the worry is that we might be reverting back to the objective risk theory. Okay, another response is to say, it isn't just the satisfaction of preferences, full stop, that matters. Instead, it's the satisfaction of preferences that were formed by the right sort of process, right? And the thought is that modification by AI is not the right sort of process. So if AI satisfies our modified preferences, it isn't satisfying the right sort of preferences. It isn't satisfying the kinds of preferences that actually do, whose satisfaction um, does contribute to our well-being, because it's only the satisfaction of preferences formed by the right sort of process that um, contribute to our well-being. Now, we need to be careful with this answer. So the thought can't just be that we have meta-preferences now that um, AI not satisfy our modified preferences in the future, um, because that would just be to rehearse basically the first sort of response that we gave. It would just be to throw another preference into the hopper, which doesn't really solve the problem. Instead, what we would have to be saying is, independently of our attitude toward this fact, it just is a fact that what promotes our well-being is the satisfaction of preferences formed by the right sort of process. But then the question is, on this view, what, what is the right sort of process? Now, a natural thought is, well, the right sort of process is one where our preferences are independently or autonomously or freely um, developed. But then it seems that most, maybe all of the preferences that we have are influenced by external factors, such as our parents, our peers, our cultural environment. So what makes AI different? Now, this isn't to say that there might not be an answer um, uh, to what makes AI different. Um, but it's just to say that it takes work, philosophical or otherwise, to articulate what the difference is. Another response might be the right sort of process is a process that gets us to better preferences. Right? But then what makes preferences better? Are preferences better when they're preferences for what gives us more pleasure or for what gives us less pleasure? Well, then again, we seem to be reverting to hedonism. Or is the thought that preferences are better when their preferences for more valuable things rather than less valuable things. But then the worry is that we're reverting back to the objective list. So finally, someone might say, listen, I don't have a theory of what the right sort of process is, but I have a paradigm, right? I mean, certainly this has got to count as the right sort of process. 
you go and you have a wide variety of experiences. You travel the world. And then you take time to reflect on life and what's meaningful in life and what are the good things in life and so on. And the preferences that you arrive at through that process are surely the right sorts of preferences. But why exactly should experiencing, having lots of experiences, be the right sort of process? Is it that by having lots of experiences, we can find out what gives us pleasure and what gives us pain? Well, then again, the theory is that we're smuggling in hedonism. Or is the thought that, um, or you know, and why is it that the right sort of process is one in which we reflect on what's good at life? Because we might learn what's good in life, but that seems to lead us back to the objective list. So in this talk, which again was just supposed to be to give you an example of the sorts of things that philosophers think about, how the sorts of things that philosophers think about when they actually bear, and some of the questions that um, scientists are worried about. Um, in this talk, I haven't really given any solutions. I haven't <laughs> given any, anything which might count as a concrete proposal. Um, but if you want those things, then support the cabinets. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, time for a few questions? Yeah, uh, why don't you go ahead. On preference at a given time. And it feels like a lot of times we have conflicting preferences, like I want to eat the candy, but I also don't want to. And it seems like a lot of what current AI systems may be exploiting are the fact that we have these separate kinds of preferences and we uh, sort of exploiting our temptations like clickbait and so on. So I'm wondering if you like, it seems like if you could split up preferences into a sort of more privileged versus less privileged preference um, that could help solve some of this problem. I was just curious what you think about that. Well, it can... strikes me that that's a, that's a different problem. Mm -hmm. than yeah. of, I mean, it seems to me that even if we imagine that the preference I had as a child was in some sense relative to that time, a privileged preference. And suppose it just, you know, there was no conflicting preference. It's, mm -hmm. it's all I cared about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, then you wouldn't have that, 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 that difficulty. But it does seem to me that as you're right, that that's a, it's already simplifying the, the problem mm. to assume that somehow there's a dominant preference at each time and we can identify what the dominant preference is. And you're right that we often do have conflicting, at the very least we have conflicting desires. Um, and when you think about how sort of current AI systems are influencing us, often they are influencing, I mean, you know, when I go down the rabbit hole, and I discover that, you know, I opened my computer to send an important email um, about some administrative matter. Instead, I spent, you know, half an hour looking at YouTube videos. Um, in some sense, uh, I wanted to watch the YouTube videos because that's what I did. Mm -hmm. and in another sense, that isn't what I wanted to do. And so then there's a question of, you know, which wants speak for a person? which I think is your question of sort of which, um, you know, which desires we're going to, to privilege. Um, and that is a question that philosophers have asked. So Harry Frankfurt, mm -hmm. um, a retired philosopher at Princeton, sort of, sort of argued that um, the sort of relevant preferences are, or the relevant desires are desires you have about your desires. So I might have a desire to watch the YouTube video and not to watch the YouTube video. But somehow the desire that speaks for me is the one that at a second order, I desire to desire, right? So I might desire to watch the YouTube video and not to, but if my second order desire is not to watch the YouTube video, then that's the desire. Right? I guess, and then when you get to the second order, you run into all the same issues you Ex talked about. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, very, that's very astute, right? And that's a question that people have, have pressed Frankfurt on, just like, you know, why don't we just keep on going on the higher order of desires? Why is it one of the second order somehow uh, uh, the one that's authoritative? 
Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Um, hello. Yeah, I was just wondering, how do you uh, differentiate between preference? Because you use preferences as opposed to needs, and um, um, why why preferences when some things that you mentioned seem to be based on human needs and other things that have more wants? It, I mean, as it's difficult for you, it seemed like toys. You really needed them because <laughs> they made you so happy. <laughs> and uh, so, so yeah, I, I was just like wondering a bit about the differentiation between those two things. Yeah, if there are two things. No, I, I, I definitely think that there are two different things. I mean, because you can want things other than what it seems like you can want things other than what you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, you could have there could be a sort of a, another theory of well-being, which is based on some sort of um, determination of what the most important human needs are, and sort of to the extent that those are satisfied. Um, person's life goes well for them. Mm -hmm. I think that that might have something like the structure of the objective risk uh, view in the, in the end. So it would, I think some of the same worries about it would um, would arise, but it also would have some of the same some of the same advantages. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. You might think AI yeah, can change our preferences, but can it necessarily does it necessarily in doing so change our needs? Mm -hmm. In, in talking about different schemes of notions of preference or desire, it seems we don't have to go to Princeton and Frank. We can <laughs> we can sit right here at Berkeley and with Robert Bellow. When Robert Bellow was writing about the habits of the heart, it was this, he was clear on making the distinction between the kind of emptiness that comes from the satisfaction of individual desires versus desires that contribute to the social good. And that in itself was uh, an evolution of a scheme from Freud of uh, that the distinction between the id and the superego, uh, that the, the notion, the popular notion of Freud was that he wanted to be less depressed and let you express your id and sort of pursue your desires. But if you read a little farther into Freud, you see that he, he made the point often that a much a more enduring form of happiness comes from the satisfaction of your ego ideals and from the satisfaction of your immediate id. So that's when you're talking about this sort of this sort of time dimension, another way of organizing that scheme would be between uh, getting what you want in the moment in an idish kind of way versus living up to your ego ideals. Right. And for the end, that solves the do I eat the candy or don't I eat the candy? issue is that Freud certainly points out in the long run, you're going to be happier not having eaten the candy. Right, right. I think the big question there is what it means to say in the long run, you're going to be, you're going to be happier. Um, uh, does that mean that in the long run, you're going to have more pleasurable experiences? I mean, so it is, is it the case like, you know, if you have a lot to drink right now, it feels great, but it's going to feel terrible tomorrow morning, which is something that he missed it makes sense of. Or is the thought that you're going to be happier in the long run, are we understanding that in really a different way, something more like the objective bliss, objective bliss picture that just is a more meaningful life to, to satisfy your head, to you know, contribute to important social goals? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jack Gallen. I'm a neuroscientist here at Berkeley, and I actually got involved in this neuroethics center kind of by accident because uh, some work I did about 10 years ago led to an unintended ethical consequence, which is the best brain decoder that had ever been invented. And it was good enough brain decoder, used MRI, non-portable technology, but it was a good enough brain decoder to uh, scare me and everyone in my lab and most of the people who saw it because it showed that we kind of have the capacity, even with our current very primitive brain technology, to decode an amazing uh, amount of information from the brain. And that obviously brings up a host of ethical issues. 
you know, the brain's a pretty complicated organ. Um, it's, of course, the thing that makes us unique and gives us consciousness and makes us humans. If we didn't have a brain, it would just be a filter feeder, like a sponge sitting on the bottom of the ocean doing nothing much interesting at all. So we all have very proprietary feelings about our brain. In fact, usually when we think of ourselves, we think of our, essentially our brain as the organ. If I think of my hand, it's my hand. It's not me, the hand, right? But my brain is kind of me. So our brains are obviously the most important organ we have from a narcissistic brain point of view, right? The brain, of course, thinks it's the most important organ. Um, but it's very, very complicated. Uh, there's, you know, 80 billion neurons. Most of those are in the cerebellum. We still don't know exactly what the cerebellum does. Uh, a lot of them are in the cerebral cortex. They're organized in these very, very complicated networks. Um, it's a truly magnificently complicated uh, and difficult organ to understand. Uh, and we have very sort of poor technolo technological tools currently to measure it and to manipulate it. So we can um, apply neuromodulatory drugs to the brain. Those usually only affect very broad brain systems. They uh, have very broad effects and a lot of unintended uh, side effects that are generally unpleasant. Uh, we have some limited ability to uh, put electrodes in the human brain to do neuromodulation, uh, either through deep brain stimulation or through electrocorticography where we record the brain signals. But the, the amount of modulation that we can do and the amount of brain signals we can read uh, currently is very, very limited. Uh, just to take an example, if you have a deep brain stimulator implanted, say, to address Parkinson's, um, that stimulator is programmed once in the doctor's office, and it's just left in that state for essentially six months straight. It never changes. It doesn't adapt depending on your circumstances or what you're trying to do. Uh, it's just sort of a fixed device. So this this is one of the most advanced brain you know technologies we have, and it's it's incredibly primitive and sort of if you just think about how the thing works, it's silly, right? It's better than nothing, but it's not where we want to go. Um, the brain is difficult to measure non-invasively. So the most advanced method we have for measuring the brain non-invasively is functional MRI. And a standard clinical fMRI machine costs you know, $6 million. The new MR, uh, sort of uh, Frankenstein MRI machine that we're building here at Berkeley uh, through an effort between Berkeley and the federal government is a $20 million uh, science project. It's very, very expensive. Obviously, people aren't going to wander around with this technology on their heads anytime soon. Uh, we have portable technologies like EEG that you can just buy in the toy store and stick on your head now, and they're almost useless. Uh, they have very low bandwidth, very low signal to noise. So our technologies for non-invasive brain measurement and modulation are also very poor. Um, but all of these things are going to change. All of these things are going to develop in the future because brain disorders in the United States are an enormous problem on a variety of fronts. You know, by depending on how you uh, look at the numbers, something on the order of say 80 million people in the United States have some sort of brain disorder that could potentially be ameliorated by an appropriate drug or a technological uh, brain intervention device. Uh, these disorders include uh, mental disorders such as you know, schizophrenia or uh, autism spectrum disorder or dyslexia or uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or depression, right? The whole panoply of mental disorders that we have. Um, these include uh, disorders that affect the motor system, like paralysis, and, uh, uh, and disorders that affect uh, the perceptual system, like blindness and um, deafness, right? So there's a huge market for uh, um, essentially neurotechnologies that can ameliorate these uh, various brain disorders. And the federal government has an enormous interest in investing in this area, and private companies, of course, ha would have uh, an enormous interest in developing these technologies also. And so there's a lot of money that goes into neuroscience. Uh, but because the brain is complicated, these investments are, are slow to pay off. And so the time scale for the ethical issues involving neuroscience, I think, is slower than the time scale for the ethical issues involving AI and genomics, because those are problems we have today. And neuroscience is kind of a problem we're going to have tomorrow. So uh, in the future, somewhere, you know, we don't know when, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, certainly within 100 years, we're going to have a variety of neurotechnologies that are going to uh, completely eclipse what we have today. 
These are going to be uh, targeted drugs that affect very specific brain subsystems or very specific classes of receptors in local regions of the brain. Um, large scale, very high capacity, closed loop invasive brain stimulation devices. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with uh, Elon Musk's company Neuralink that is developing a very cool technology that will be able to put in hundreds or thousands of extremely thin uh, microwires into the brain. These should be relatively biocompatible, certainly compared to what we have today. And these will uh, dramatically increase the bandwidth for both writing into the brain and for reading information from the brain. Um, there are gonna be invasive brain stimulation devices that aren't just set it and forget it, but which are actually closed loop systems that uh, measure the environment around uh, a patient and that also measure the brain state and then adapt the brain stimulation uh, in closed loop form based on current circumstances, basically based on uh, what the environment is and what the patient needs to optimize their behavior. And those are already uh, currently in uh, sort of early scientific trials. I'm involved in one of those teams and um, uh, those will be coming down the pike in 20 or 30 years. Um, they're gonna be portable devices for non-invasive brain reading. Uh, nobody knows when this is gonna happen because nobody knows what technology would support this. But you know, one of the great things about science is things happen that nobody expected. And it's just a matter of time before we can read brains non-invasively and you can just wear a little thinking hat. You know, you go to Japan, you don't speak Japanese, you think in English and it speaks Japanese out your hat, right? It would be a great device and it's just a matter of time before that happens. So um, these technologies bring up sort of four general areas of ethical concern in neuroscience that I've listed here. Uh, and these kind of obvious when you think about it, but there are, each of them is a big topic and each of them overlaps with some aspect of the other neuroethics issues we have, uh, we're going to be dealing with in the center involving either genomics or AI. Uh, the first is obviously, uh, sorry, the first may not be obvious, it's agency and identity. Um, even today, there are issues with agency and identity involving deep brain stimulation. People who have deep brain stimulators implanted uh, sometimes suffer from um, changes in their behavior that they feel they have no control over that uh, can have dramatic uh, effects on themselves and their family life. For example, they can become obsessive gamblers or they can become unconcerned with certain aspects of their life that they used to be concerned with. And this not only changes their behavior, but it changes their perception of themselves because they essentially feel that they have an urge or a uh, uh, they're being compelled to do something that they would that it sort of violates their their normal perception of themselves. So so these devices can have an enormous effect on agency and identity. Uh, the second is kind of the most obvious uh, issue, and it's the one that I deal with the most. It has to do with privacy. You know, uh, uh, everything that you consciously can think about in your brain, everything that's in in conscious awareness right now is potentially decodable, because uh, if you are conscious of something. That means that there's information percolating around in active brain circuits, and anything that's in active brain circuits is potentially decodable, even things that you're not aware of. So for example, it's uh, 10 minutes to 10. Some of you probably somewhere deep down in the bowels of your brain are thinking about lunch, like, oh, I'd like a burrito for lunch. Maybe that's not a conscious thought yet, but if we had a brain decoding device, if that's uh, even a, a sort of a unconscious thought um, that's percolating around in active brain circuits, that is potentially decodable. In fact, the only information that we can't decode from the brain is uh, currently is stuff that's locked away in long-term memory. So for example, if I ask you to think about the name of your first grade teacher, you can probably do that. Okay, I can do that and that's pretty good for me because I have a poor memory. Um, but you probably haven't thought about that for a long time. So before I asked you to think about your first grade teacher, it was locked away in long-term memory circuits in some form that neuroscientists still don't understand. But the second you sort of emerge that thought into active working memory, now it's potentially decoded. So a large range of things are potentially um, We don't have any good systems for giving informed consent uh, for these sorts of devices. We don't have any good systems for controlling access to the information if somebody controls a device or builds a device. We don't have uh, any good regulatory scheme for governing how or who or when we'll have access to that information. And in fact, under current evidentiary law in the United States, your thoughts are considered to be of the same sort of evidence as say your blood or your hair or your fingernails. In other words, the government can compel you to give them up. 
So if we had a brain decoding device today, the government could put it on your head and force you to think about the crime and decode all that information. You would have absolutely no privacy rights over that information. Um, the third issue is bias. Obviously, bias is an inherent part of the human condition, and it enters all human decisions, and including all uh, efforts to develop science and technologies. And these bias, of course, emerges in a lot of different ways. The Ethics Center is very concerned with bias. I know the AI community recently has, this has been a big issue, uh, having to do with bias in AI algorithms. And um, we are also need to think about this in terms of the development of neurotechnologies. We need to think about what human participants are being selected for both basic science trials and what human groups are going to be used to develop these technologies and to verify them and show that they work. Uh, and uh, these biases also are going to obviously enter into uh, in economic decisions having to do with who gets access to neurotechnologies and how they're distributed, uh, which brings us to the last issue, enhancement. Um, you know, just as uh, uh, Stuart mentioned, for the future of genetics is probably going to lead to a lot of pressure to apply a genetic manipulation to human enhancement. And of course, that will also happen for neuroscience. The minute uh, there are neurotechnologies that can increase your memory or the, uh, your reasoning ability or your general intelligence, there will be a large clamor to have these technologies and to adopt them for individual people. And um, there's going to be big issues about fairness of access to those technologies and how they can be uh, deployed widely and um, how we can minimize bias in both the application of those technologies and bias against people who may not want those technologies. Um, there are also weird side cases you may not have thought of, for example, having to do with corporate governance. So I don't know how many of you pay attention to the neuroscience news. But uh, there's a, there has been a long-standing effort to uh, develop brain implants for the blind that uh, are essentially electrodes that are implanted in the visual cortex. And there are a handful of patients with these devices. And the company that manufactured these devices has just gone out of business. And so now there are people with brain implants, and uh, they can't get their batteries replaced. And you know if the processor breaks, they, they have no ability to replace the processor, and they have these brain implants in their head, and they're not sure who's going to take care of them. And it's obviously a big ethical uh, dilemma involving corporate responsibility. So uh, it's not as if nobody has thought about this issue. There are a lot of groups that are involved in ethics. Um, the Neuroethics Society is the, the big one, but the Society for Neuroscience, which is the largest neuroscience uh, group in the world, the meeting has 30,000 attendees every year. They have an ethics group. Uh, the IEEE, which is the largest engineering society in the world, has a brain community that has a very strong ethics component in it. And actually, uh, I'm head of the IEEE brain community this year, and that's the meeting I have to run at 10. Uh, so we're very, very interested in neuroethics. Um, the National Academy of Sciences has uh, had a program for the last several years on neuroethics and the law, because judges are becoming increasingly faced with uh, neuroscience evidence, and they need to decide whether they should admit that evidence in court. So there are big ethical issues about transferring neuroscience knowledge into the legal system that have to be addressed. Uh, the European Union has been thinking about uh, updating their privacy uh, rules. You know, the European Union has very good privacy rules, but they are constantly under update because every time the EU promotes a privacy rule, people find a way to get around it. So they're constantly revising the rules. And one of the things they're considering is revising the rules to focus on brain privacy, is to encompass brain privacy as well as everything else. And finally, weirdly, uh, in a really interesting move, the government of Chile last year uh, proposed a constitutional amendment, uh, which is going to be a neuro rights amendment to the constitution. That hasn't been voted on yet, uh, but it's, it's, it's in process in Chile. And that was an effort uh, promoted by Rafa Yusta, who's a, a very well-known uh, neuroscientist from the university. So there are a lot of groups involved in this. Uh, and we also do ethics education for neuroscientists and engineers. All young neuroscientists have to take sort of an ethics uh, module or, or a short ethics course in order to maintain their graduate status. This is required by the NIH. Uh, all engineers take a series of ethics courses. And, and, and so both of these groups are trained in ethics. But I guess from my perspective, the current ethics training for neuroscientists and neuroengineers is focused on kind of current ethical issues. For example, don't fabricate your data. 
don't mistreat your subjects, it, uh, be very, very concerned about animal welfare, things like that. Those are all very, very important issues, but they don't address the future ethical issues we're gonna have in neurotechnology. And there's currently no preparation for the people who will be developing these technologies, which is the young graduate students and postdocs. They're gonna be the leaders in, you know, out there in 20 or 30 or 40 years doing the neuroscience and developing the technologies that are gonna change the way we do neuroscience and the way we, we apply neuroscience to the brain. And they need to think, be educated uh, in such a way that they can think not only about the current ethical issues, but about future ethical issues, including ones that we haven't even thought of yet. So I'm very, very excited about that specific part of our, uh, our Kavli Center, because I think it's gonna have the largest long-term impact on how neurotechnology is actually developed and applied in the world. Uh, that's it, thanks for your time. Okay, my name is Brad Ringeisen, uh, Executive Director for the IGI, uh, and I just want to welcome everybody here. This is fantastic. So this is our second meeting since post-pandemic in, in, this, in this conference room, so it's absolutely great to see everybody here and, and welcome to being able to actually interact with colleagues and peers again. It's, it's fantastic. So um, the Innovative Genomics Institute was founded uh, by uh, uh, Jennifer Doudna, and so this is really the house that, that Jennifer has built. And... The goal of the Institute really is to advance genome engineering. Uh, and it's not just for human health and not just for agriculture, but we're also, also working towards climate as well. And so my, my talk today is gonna kind of touch on all of those things and how bioethics and the regulatory environment, as well as the technology development, really do all merge together here in this building and in the Innovative Genomics Institute. And that's one of the reasons that we're so excited to collaborate as a partner with the Kavli Institute. So this is the scientific strategy for the IGI. It goes across three different areas of tool development. And we heard uh, this morning uh, already the talk about technology development and tool development and how these enabling technologies have a role uh, in, in how they are used. Um, and so at the IGI, we are not in the spectrum on the side where we just are gonna develop those tools in a vacuum and let others make decisions. We absolutely have a public impact a team that is integrated with the scientists that are in the Institute. And we start thinking as early as we possibly can about what the potential uses of the technology advances might be so that it's not being done in a vacuum. And that, that's really one of the philosophies of, of the IGI. And then the two application spaces really bridge between health and climate. Some of the same tools can be used in both, um, which is really, I think, where it's interesting, where you have scientists that are working in plants and they talk to the scientists that are working on human cells and little light bulbs go off and they start sort of cross-pollinating one another, um, which I think is really an exciting part of what the IGI has to do. Um, and so, you know, our plan generally in health is to look at genetic disease uh, and as, use that as a test case, which is relatively straightforward, relatively, you know, uh, you have a single gene. Can you correct that gene? Can you knock that gene, off, gene out to be able to do uh, a repair, which then sort of solves that disease, and then move to even more complex diseases that maybe involve multiple genes. Maybe it involves you know, gene expression across tens or maybe even 100 genes. Can we push it to that limit? And so that's generally what we think of from human health. Start with relatively simple do proof of concept there, and then bridge into much, much more complicated disease, diseases as well. Climate change, somewhat similar. Some, in some cases, uh, you have uh, a, a gene that can, uh, you're going to hear, I think, later from Nicholas, who is working on a, oh, maybe not, maybe not today, but Nicholas is sitting in the back. Wave, Nicholas. I'll, people can talk to you in the, in, in the break. Nicholas is developing a, a, a strain uh, of modified rice that's drought tolerant. And so, again, that's something that we can do right now today, that, it, that you know, we can engineer the, the, the plant to lose less water and require less water input. But can we then bridge to much more complicated scenarios where, you know, maybe we can engineer the plant to be able to use less uh, uh, fertilizer and, and maybe generate more uh, uh, nitrogen either on its own or work with uh, microbes in the soil to be able to deal with, uh, with, with using less fertilizer. So, again, simpler things, 
move into more complex, but that's where you have to think about some of the, uh, the ethical and regulatory aspects as well. All right, so CRISPR genome editing, this is in a, in a nutshell, you can either double strand break and snip and let something repair on its own, which essentially knocks out uh, that, that function of that gene, or on the right-hand side, you can actually have a donor template of DNA where you snip and then add in just sort of almost like a Lego brick, add in that new gene that provides a new capability. Okay, so you can knock out or you can add in new functionality as well. I'll give you a couple really short, really quick examples. Uh, the first, this is actually Victoria Gray, who is the first person who was cured uh, by a CRISPR uh, tool to be able to repair uh, and, and provide uh, 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 essentially a, a cure for sickle cell disease. Um, but there are now many, many applications of CRISPR, and this just gives you what an amazing array to consider that, that Jennifer's discovery and those that have been doing gene editing, it's only about 10 years since the discovery of CRISPR. And now look at all the different companies, all the different organizations, all the different diseases that are being addressed by, by, by CRISPR. It's a pretty impressive array um, of technologies, liver diseases, autoimmune diseases, sickle cell. Uh, it's pretty remarkable from a guy who's been looking at technology uh, at the highest levels uh, of the government it's pretty impressive the trajectory of what this technology has done. It, it bodes well for the future. Let's put it that way. I think we're still like right here with this technology, but the fact that there's this many people with this much money being flooded into this, into this market right now, it's a good sign that this technology is for real and that it's actually gonna deliver on some of the promises um, that are out there. Now, this is not done without the possibility of some ethical uh, dilemmas. And so we have to start thinking about some of the issues, things like the benefits versus the harm, uh, rights of individuals versus societies, fairness, justice, the representation and the decision-making pro pro process. I think all too often technology is developed without actually including some of those that are gonna be most dramatically affected by the technology. So I think the IGI is one of these places where we can be a forum and a convener to help bring in some of those that are affected by the technology and, and listen, and not just develop technology uh, in, in a void. Um, treatment versus enhancement. Oh boy, that's, that's, uh, that takes me back uh, to, to my previous job where uh, pretty much everybody in the military wanted to try to enhance function in some way, shape or form. Do you do that? Is that something that's ethical? Um, there are certain countries that are most definitely trying to squeeze out an extra five or ten percent of intelligence, um, you know. And what are the what are the ethics? Uh, it, is it within the realm of reason that CRISPR could even do this? Um, and so this is it's 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 really is an absolutely fantastic and, and fascinating um, discussion. Disease prevention. Can you take a healthy individual and what are the pros and cons and risks associated with taking someone that is healthy today that may not be healthy five or 10 or 20 years from now? Do you do a genetic modification now to be able to provide a potentially better future for that individual? Um, very challenging, very interesting conversations uh, to, try to, to try to have. All right, so uh, I just wanna give you a little bit of an update about what the IGI is currently doing. We actually do have uh, a, a approval by the FDA to treat humans to try to cure sickle cell disease. We are one of those uh, organizations, along with seven or eight different clinical trials that are going on right now, but we are a nonprofit. We are here at the University of California, and we are the only sickle cell uh, treatment right now that is entirely state and federal and philanthropically funded. Um, and, and that's right in line with what we want to do at the IGI, which is increase the accessibility and affordability. Um, we are trying to do this, and Lee has been one of the people here at the IGI looking at affordability. How can technology improvements allow us to be able to reduce the costs? Um, if a cure costs $2 million, is it really a cure? I would argue that it probably isn't because it's only gonna affect a handful of people when even in just in the United States, there are over 100,000 people um, that are suffering from sickle cell disease. So how do we do that? Hopefully, technology like CRISPR and some of the technologies that we're developing here can help create a real actual cure that can affect uh, all of those populations. This is an example of trying to go beyond those genetic diseases. And we have several um, proposals and several ideas about how we can actually extend 
to things like cancer, tremendously more complicated, not just genetic. It's all about gene expression. It's about uh, potentially uh, changes inside the body that are occurring that then ultimately result in uh, a, a pathogenic disease like cancer. Is there a way to use CRISPR potentially to edit different types of T cells or regulate, uh, as we show on the bottom left-hand side, regulate the immune system and can try to control uh, the, and, and, and modify sort of a, a stasis of, of the immune system to be able to help prevent disease? And can we go after something that's as intractable right now as neurodegenerative disease? I mean, as you probably saw, the FDA approved the first drug for Alzheimer's, but it was controversial because people weren't sure that the risks of taking this drug are outweighed by maybe a potentially very marginal improvement in the outcomes for the disease. So, you know, can we use CRISPR as a more precise tool to potentially help either prevent this disease or potentially even treat it? But very much more complicated and probably not something that's going to occur in the next few years, but perhaps in the next decade. So... This is the direction of where Jennifer and I are going with the Institute. We also show a beautiful new building here that might uh, in the next four or five years be right outside of uh, this. And so there, there's a huge possibility for uh, improving the laboratory space and, and, and where we're going as an Institute as well. So that's an exciting uh, thing going on as well. Okay, so with respect to health, sickle cell, we've talked about sort of health justice versus experimentation, the affordability access. Uh, there's also an element here of patient mistrust. Um, there are populations uh, that are distrustful of technology. It, it, we don't have to look any further than, than COVID and the vaccines and whether people want to use these t vaccines that are life-saving or not. The same is true for sickle cell. Uh, and there are populations that have been abused um, by, by new technologies and experimentation. Let's listen. Let, let's try to bring those voices into the fold uh, and provide education and be able to understand the safety and, the, and, and sort of the pathway to regulatory approval. For neurodegenerative disease, um, we're engineering the brain. You can't, this is, the brain is where that disease is occurring. So what are the ethics uh, uh, and, and the regulatory environment for actually going in and editing, uh, editing the brain? I think that's uh, interesting. I mentioned the prospects of interventions in healthy individuals. I actually truly believe that once some of these plaques and these amyloid plaques for something like Alzheimer's take hold inside the brain, that you may actually be able to treat it. You may not be able to reverse the disease at that point. You may actually have to try to intervene at an earlier point, which means it's probably going to be a healthy individual uh, that, that you need to try to prevent some of these really recalcitrant things from forming in the brain. Do you do that? When do you do that? What are the risks? The FDA doesn't think that way right now, uh, but that might be a way that into the future that we have, to, we have to, to, to think about. All right, how do we do this? Well, this is the IGI, this is Cavalry. I think these are the things that, that we can start to do to, to be able to convene and ask questions. The community, the patient outreach, um, addressing the, the, the fact that technology can actually help accessibility. Um, but what, what are the risks that are associated with that? Um, having a transparent ethical framework. That's what we uh, proposed at the Department of Defense because we had the big D in front of our name. We had to be 100% transparent. Our choice was to be transparent. Here at the IGI, it's exactly the same. We want that transparency and that's a way to be able to help develop trust um, as, as, as we're developing the technology. And then at the same time, engaging international bodies uh, and try to have this be the world community, that it's not just the Berkeley community or the United States, but we really want this to be an international community as well. We're also looking at agriculture and climate, uh, and this technology has, a, has the potential to make an enormous impact, probably affect billions of people rather than, than tens or hundreds of thousands of people on the, on the health side. So this is something that we absolutely want to do at the IGI. It could be in bio biomanufacturing. It could be in preserving biodiversity and, and all of that what we love about, about the world and about the planet Earth. And it also can help with nutrition, with climate resiliency, food security, um, and, and all of those uh, aspects of agriculture as well. CRISPR has the ability to potentially affect a tremendous array uh, of, of opportunity space in agriculture and climate. It has the ability to be able to minimize fertilizer use, um, pesticide use. Um, California, right? <laughs> How long have we been in a drought here in California? What if we could, we could help uh, reduce the amount of irrigation to be able to preserve the water um, for those that, that need to use the water rather than just using it um, to support our agriculture system? 
uh, crop resilience, um, drought, flood, temperature. Uh, I saw the other day that I think in India, they were having an enormous heat wave where I think the temperatures were up to 120 or 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, temperature resilience is obviously something that's important. Um, we have to do all of this with respect to increasing yield, at least stabilizing and increasing yield, because we have to feed more and more people into the future. So any of these changes that we make with respect to climate resilience or resilience to different pathogens has to be done so we can still provide enough caloric uh, value to, to the world. And so that's something that um, all of those uh, here uh, working on these areas would like to try to do as well. And then I'm sure that you're familiar with the fact that uh, animals and our dependence on the protein um, that's provided by animals has a pretty dramatically negative impact on the climate as well um, by, by methane emissions. So are there ways that we can actually go in and actually improve and reduce the methane emissions from, from cattle and livestock? There's a really pretty, pretty significant effort that's emerging at the IGI to do this as well. So, you know, <clears throat> we, we have a huge array of things that we're able to work with here in these areas. But this raises an entirely different set of ethical questions than I discussed um, from, from the health aspects. So, you know, we, we are asking ourselves questions about the environment now, which we all live in the environment, right? So I think we all have a stake in this now. Um, so it's not just those that might be high, at high risk of, of getting sick and, 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 and whether you're going to get sick or not get sick. We all have a stake in this now. So who gets to decide? Who bears the risk of acting? Who bears the risk of not acting? Sometimes, especially for climate, those that are affected by climate are actually sort of in, in the lowest socioeconomic uh, ranges and are those that um, sort of uh, have the most at stake uh, for not acting potentially. Um, what should our relationship with nature be? Um, do we engineer nature? Do we not engineer nature? What is the cost of not acting? Uh, and I think that these are questions um, that, that really, uh, that we have to think about. Unintended consequences, um, localized release. You know, there's gene drives in mosquito populations. Um, how do you localize that? Uh, do, does it spread across an entire species of, of mosquito? Um, if you're gonna do uh, modifications in something like soil, uh, biology, that's one of the great things. It scales, it, 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 it grows, uh, which could mean it could be entirely impactful for climate. <laughs> you want something that scales, but at the same time, what are the ethical implications of biological microbes or plants scaling across a natural environment? So um, that's, those, these are some of the questions that we're thinking about here at, at the IGI. So what do we do? Well, it's, it's somewhat similar. We're, we're going to convene. We're going to convene the regulators. We're going to convene the, the farmers, the stakeholders that, that are involved in this, the indigenous communities that might be affected, that have ownership of some of the land that, that might be affected by these technologies. So we are going to act to convene. Um, uh, and we're also looking at training the next generation. And, and Lee's been uh, uh, integral in, in this uh, community that's called Burgett. Help me, Lee. Uh, Berkeley Ethical Regulatory Group. It's for innovative technologies. Innovative technologies. So, so Burgett is a great convening of, of some of these uh, stakeholders here in the Berkeley community. And, and I'm, I'm really excited about continuing to, to, to engage with that community. Um, and so we have done some international summits. Uh, we've also uh, provided opportunities for our scientists to interact with the public, interact with the ethicists, Loved hearing uh, the f uh, philosophy community. So I, I would love to continue to be able to engage to make sure we get the technologists involved with all of these, all of these communities. So with that, uh, we'll, 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 go, we'll go to break, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, like I said, this is an area that I'm really, really passionate and excited about and just so happy to, to see everybody here today. So thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take a couple take questions? questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's take a couple questions. We're behind, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, if there are any questions, maybe one or two, and then we'll go to break. Oh, is that a question? Awesome, okay. Yay. Great, thanks for a great talk. Um, so I'm sure this is gonna be a question that applies broadly to all phases of the Copley Center to be, but since the idea has been around a little bit longer and has a little bit more time to develop some process, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about 
how you prioritize all of these different efforts, um, both the technology side, the implementation side, on the society side. How do you think about allocating effort and time, resources, people to these different initiatives? And, yeah. You know, describe yeah. a little bit uh, of that process. Colin, it's a great question. And uh, I, 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 Lee and I have this conversation uh, somewhat regularly. Um, you know, I, I am tasked with the really difficult uh, process of trying to support all of what you see here. Uh, that usually takes money. And so part of the decision is, is strictly based on a donor. And do we have a donor that, that uh, is interested in a certain topic? And, and it, you know, it, it, it's always a mix between can we find funding to do the work that we do, which is expensive? And if it was an ideal world and I could just wave a magic wand, of course, we would, we would just work on those that are the, the, you know, that would serve the, you know, the communities and the vision that Jennifer has in terms of accessibility and affordability. So my job is to try to convince donors that this is important that we are different than other scientific institutes that are in the country that maybe doesn't have the mission uh, of trying to serve those that, that we think need it the most. It works sometimes, doesn't work other times. Um, and so that's where the community of thought takes, takes shape. And we have our public impact team and we go through a process. It's a process. I'll, I'll take the neurodegenerative disease in exa as an example. You know, uh, we're looking at a specific gene that has a high risk population for Alzheimer's dementia. Turns out that gene is mostly prevalent and indicative and causative in, uh, uh, you know, Caucasian, you know, in, uh, communities. If you look at it in other ethnic communities within the United States or within the world, it's not as causative. It's not as impactful. But can we use this one community as a, a proof of concept and a demonstration and, and keep the momentum going to be able to do that? Those are the types of questions that we have to make almost on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like, we have to keep the momentum going. We have to show that CRISPR works, but at the same time, we want to be able to, to use this technology to have the impact on the broad, broadest number of people and in those populations that we're most uh, in, you know, interested in trying to serve. So it, it's, I, I don't have a final answer for that other than to say that it is a discussion, that it's a community, that you know, ultimately it, it's probably Jennifer and I's decision about whether we start a project or don't start a project, but we try to do it, make those decisions that are not in a vacuum. And, and that's, that's my answer. My answer is that we don't just close our ears and say, this person wants to give us money to do this project, so we're going to do it. We're going to do this project regardless. We, we, we try to bring in uh, and, and listen to, to other, uh, uh, to, to make that decision not in a, in a, in a, in a vacuum. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so next up, we will be hearing a little bit more about current and emerging ethical challenges in AI from Stuart Russell. Thanks, okay, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'm gonna to try to move through this as quickly as I can to get to questions, which I think is the most important part. Uh, so first of all, let's get everyone on the same page. AI is about making intelligent machines. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, for most of the history of the field, it's meant machines whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives, uh, that they behave rationally, they do the right thing as opposed to the wrong thing. Uh, and our goal, uh, as stated pretty early on and, and has been consistent throughout, is that we want to make systems that are uh, general purpose, that for any task that we care to have them do, they can quickly learn how to do it, uh, and maybe do it better than human beings. Uh, and this will have enormous impacts. Um, a question we don't ask very often is, well, what if we actually succeed in doing that? You know, um, for cancer researchers, it's a pretty straightforward answer, right? Well, then we can cure people or even prevent them from ever getting cancer. Wouldn't that be great, right? And most people would say, yeah, it's pretty much unequivocally a good thing. Um, Yes, although I remember that Phillips did try to convince the Czech government that if they allowed more smoking, they would, uh, they would kill off people at 60 and they wouldn't have a lot of health care expenses for, for the elderly. Uh, so not everyone agrees that curing cancer is a good thing. 
um, but most of us. Um, so, you know, one thing we could do with general purpose AI is actually do what we already know how to do, which is, uh, you know, for us uh, in privileged societies, we can have a decent standard of living. Uh, we can do that for everyone on Earth. And um, that will be about a tenfold increase in GDP. Uh, and the net present value, as economists call it, the cash equivalent, about 13 and a half quadrillion dollars. So that's sort of a lowball estimate of the value of achieving general purpose AI, right? The true value is probably much higher because we can actually then do things that we can't currently do, right? We could do uh, much better uh, healthcare on an individualized basis, far uh, more effective kinds of education that would deliver enormous value to individuals. Uh, we could accelerate the rate of science and so on. So the upside is really unbelievably high. That creates a kind of a giant magnet in the future that is pulling us towards it. And the closer we get to it, the more the force of that magnet uh, is pulling us along. Um, and we are, see we are seeing now some, some real uh, advances. Uh, we moved out of the lab you know, onto the roads. Uh, we you know, beat the human world go champion, something that was predicted to take another 100 years. Uh, back in 97, when we beat the well, when we say we, when an AI, pro an AI program beat the human world champion at chess, uh, you know, experts said, oh, well, that's fine. You know, chess is easy, goes really hard. It'll take another 100 years for that to happen, but uh, s slightly less than 20 years. But as we move out of the lab, we also see uh, some of the negative consequences starting to occur. Right? I, I take it this is a rhetorical question. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's... It, it's pervasive in all kinds of subtle ways, and the ads that people see in what happens when they submit their resumes uh, with automated filtering of resumes and what kind of resumes get through the filter, um, in uh, algorithms that are deciding who gets uh, mortgages, you know, who gets credit cards, what, kind, what size of credit limit do you have on your card, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to become more pervasive as AI systems start to do more and more things in the economy. Um, and one way of thinking about this is that uh, all these algorithms are simply trained with the wrong objective. The objective that we train predictive algorithms with is consistency with the training data, period. And that's just stupid, right? If anyone actually sat down and thought, is this the right objective for algorithms? They would say, oh, no, of course it's not the right objective. But that's actually uh, what's happened. Now, there are technical uh, solutions in terms of mathematical definitions of fairness, of you know, different definitions that may be appropriate for different applications. Um, and they create real trade-offs because, in fact, you can't have accuracy and fairness uh, both being maximized simultaneously. So, uh, you know, so someone ends up paying, uh, and who's going to pay? These are all policy questions, uh, and, and uh, we don't have good answers for those. You know, other things that AI is doing, uh, magnifying, uh, disinformation, facilitating cybercrime. You know, I saw uh, an estimate from apparently a reputable source. Of course, it might be misinformation, but saying that cybercrime costs the world six trillion dollars a year, right? Which is ten times the amount we spend on software and ten times the amount we spend on semiconductors. So, so in that sense, uh, you know, the entire computing industry is a net loss to the human race. Uh, so we're obviously doing something wrong there. Uh, you know, we, we are now seeing uh, AI used uh, in weapons to kill people uh, without a human in the loop. So the weapon is finding human targets, deciding which ones to attack, and then killing them. Um, and this is only going to get uh, worse uh, and worse, you know, creating potentially weapons of mass destruction where one person can press a button and launch 10 million weapons uh, and wipe out entire cities, entire ethnic groups, uh, whatever uh, nefarious goal people want to have happen. Um, so there is, there are some uh, some bright, uh, some bright uh, points on the horizon. One, one is that the new uh, EU AI law, which is still being debated, um, has a, uh, a very concrete ban on the impersonation of human beings. So that when you are interacting with another entity, you have a right to know if it's a human being or not. 
Uh, and this gets to the fundamental question of human dignity, right, which is the basis for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the European Charter on Human Rights is all about human dignity. But if you don't even know if it's a human being, then how can you apply the concept of human dignity uh, to, to the interaction, the relationship? Um, so here's a quick question, right? Which of these is fake and which, which is real? They're all fake. Yes, <laughs> correct. These are, these are all fake. Um, and, and these will soon be animated, you know, speaking to you, uh, interacting with you. The metaverse, uh, if you've heard about that, this is Facebook's new uh, business project, you know, to create a, a vast simulated world in which everyone will spend all their time, uh, is going to be populated, you know, if they have their way, uh, with vast numbers of fake humans who will be your friends. Uh, you will never know that they're not human, um, but they'll gradually be convincing you to buy the latest Gucci watch or, or whatever it is, and you won't even know, what, you know that this is happening. Right? So be, instead of banner ads, they'll be you know, apparently your friends. Uh, <laughs> right? And this is, this is really uh, not a future that people want. Um, so people talk about uh, the impact on employment, you know, economists argue this uh, both ways, but I think they're coming around to the idea that, that yes, if, if there's a, you know, if there's, in the extreme case, an exact copy of you who is um, a little bit more cheerful, a little bit less hungover, you know, quite a bit better at the job and willing to work for free, uh, that most of us aren't going to be able to outcompete that, uh, that copy of themselves. And, uh, and so there will be uh, real impacts on employment. Uh, why they put a Terminator robot uh, in the article. This is something I've been arguing with journalists for years. Please stop putting Terminator robots in every article about AI. Uh, but I'm losing that battle. Anyway, but you know, if you take this to its logical conclusion, you get the world of Wall-E, right? Where, uh, where human beings are, are looked after by machines, where the machines run the civilization. Um, and the consequence, as in fact E.M. Forster noted in his 1909 story, The Machine Stops, which I highly recommend uh, because it predicted the internet, uh, email, video conferencing, MOOCs, uh, computer-induced obesity, uh, email backlogs, uh, you name it. Uh, he talked about that in that story. But what happens is we become infantilized. The chain of passing our civilization on, knowledge and skills to the next generation, which has been essential for uh, for more than two million years, right? Before the human race began, our, you know, the, our predecessors were passing on technological skills to the next generation. Uh, so through hundreds of thousands of generations, we've done this uh, at a cost of trillions of person years of teaching and learning. That chain could break when it's no longer necessary for us to do it because our machines can take over the knowledge and the skills and run our civilization for us. So those are just some of the, uh, the ethical and I would say common sense questions uh, that come up with AI. Um, but what I want to talk about for the last few minutes is this one. This is Alan Turing, who's the founder of computer science. And, uh, and he gave a speech in 1951. He talked about uh, the future of AI. He said, it seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Um, and no, he doesn't prevent, uh, present any solution, any mitigation. Uh, this is just a straightforward prediction. Uh, so um, uh, whether this is an ethical question or just a common sense question, I think it was more a common sense. Like, like, we don't want our nuclear power stations to explode. That's not an ethical dilemma. Right? We don't want AI to take over the world and extinguish the human race. That's not an ethical dilemma. It's common sense. Um, but it's, it's the, the kinds of question I think that the Calvary Center is going to have to help with. So one way I think about this is that, in fact, uh, the reason why making AI better and better makes things worse and worse uh, is that we've actually got the definition of the field wrong. Right? The way we think about uh, designing and constructing uh, and deploying AI systems is a mistake. Um, 
And this is uh, what I said at the beginning, right? Machines whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. And it's, it's a methodology that's common not just to AI, but all these other disciplines that I listed, where we specify objectives in some form, cost functions, loss functions, utility functions, reward functions, uh, you name it. Uh, we specify them, and then we, op the, we, we create optimizing machinery uh, that we then deploy. And of course, this doesn't work, right? We've known that for thousands of years, and you know, King Midas is one example uh, where his specification, his objective, everything I touch should turn to gold, right, uh, was a mistake, because when that was deployed in the real world, his food and his drink and his family all turned to gold, right? So, and, and many cultures have the same uh, legend in different forms, and, uh, and it's an important lesson that we in AI and uh, to some extent in economics and other areas haven't learned properly. Uh, so, um, you know, if, if, you're, if a genie grants you three wishes, right, what's the third wish? It's always, you know, please undo the first two wishes, <laughs> right, because I misspecified the objective. Um, and it's starting to happen in uh, you know, in, in really quite dramatic ways already uh, because we deploy technology without thinking through this issue properly beforehand. Um, so when you look at the social media algorithms, which some people blame for the sort of gradual dissolution of democracy uh, in the world uh, and, and a lot of the, the bad stuff that's been happening over the last decade, those algorithms are designed to maximize a specified objective. Um, it could be click through the probability that you click on the thing that's recommended, the next YouTube video or whatever it might be, uh, or they maximize engagement or, uh, or you know, eye, eyeball time. What the, the point here is that um, that objective is, a, is really a proxy for you know, revenue generation and um, and I think, I don't want to necessarily blame the platforms, uh, I think what they thought originally was that to, to solve that problem, you would just, the algorithms would learn to send people what they want to read or watch, right? As opposed to sending people stuff they're not interested in. And it sounds like a, you know, a nice alignment of interests here. But in fact, that's not the optimal solution. The optimal solution uh, as, as Nico <laughs> pointed out, right, is to modify people's preferences to be easier to satisfy. Uh, and that's exactly what the algorithms are doing, possibly aided and abetted by the marketing department's A-B testing and uh, the, the sort of industries that spring up to feed the preferences of people who have been modified in this way, right? The algorithms don't care what your political opinions are, or they don't even know you have political opinions, or, or brains, or bodies, or even existence, right? You are just a sequence of clicks to the algorithm, and they just want to produce a sequence of clicks that in the long run maximizes the total, uh, you know, total revenue. Um, and by making you more predictable, maybe more extreme, like they, you know, if, you, if you express an interest in the environment, they can turn you into an eco-terrorist. If you, you know, express an interest in defense, uh, they can turn you into a, a, an extreme militarist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and so if they were better, if the algorithms were better at understanding human psychology and, and, uh, and, and devising brainwashing sequences that were more effective, the outcome would be far worse, right? So the better the AI, when you have misspecified objectives, the worse the outcome, the more um, of a mess the algorithms are going to make with the parts of the world that were not specified properly in the objective. Um, so we need a different way of thinking about AI. So get rid of this notion of intelligence uh, and replace it with a notion that we want, you know, we humans want to build machines that are beneficial to we humans, right? Um, our objectives, and, and as, as Nico pointed out, this is not a straightforward notion that, you know, what are our objectives and so on, but um, at least this is a step in the right direction. Not the objectives that we write down in the objective function, but our actual preferences about what we want the future to be like. Uh, and of course, the difficulty is that those preferences are in us. We may not, we, in fact, we can't write them down. We may not even be aware of them. We haven't thought them through, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the goal uh, that we would like our AI systems to satisfy. And we can turn it actually into a mathematical problem where 
uh, you know, it's a, so it's a, a multiplayer game, as economists would call it, uh, where the machine's payoff in this game is whatever the human's payoff is. But this is the really important part. The machine doesn't know what that payoff is. Right, so it's operating under uncertainty about its own objective, but the, its own objective is whatever it is that humans want the future to be. Um, and when you solve those games, and we've solved small instances just to see what happens, uh, and you know, others are just you know, thought experiments, um, it's clear that the behavior you get from the AI system is completely and qualitatively different from the classical case where you have a fixed known objective. Um, so, for example, it makes sense for such a system to ask permission if it's about to do some action that changes parts of the world about whose value it's uncertain, right? So if you have a climate engineering system and it comes up with this amazing solution to get carbon dioxide levels back to pre-industrial and it turns the oceans into sulfuric acid, and it doesn't know your preferences about the oceans, right? Well, it doesn't just do it, right? There's actual positive incentive for the algorithm to ask you, is this okay, right? I'm going to change the, ocean, <clears throat> the oceans into sulfuric acid. Is that good or bad, right? Because it wants to avoid, by the fact that the payoffs are supposed to be aligned, right? it wants to avoid doing anything that would make you unhappy. So that's, how, that, that's where the incentive to ask permission comes from. And in the extreme case, it will want to be switched off if you want to switch it off. Whereas the classical fixed objective pursuer wants not to be switched off, because it, if it's switched off, it can't achieve the objective you've given it, right? And so uh, we go from, a, in the classical case, uh, a control failure. Uh, in the new case, we actually have an incentive for the machine. It wants to be controlled by humans. Uh, and we can show it's actually rational for us to, to build machines that solve these assistance games uh, correctly. And the, make, the better the AI in this case, uh, the outcomes end up being better rather than worse. So there's many questions um, about uh, how this, this simple mathematical idea uh, extends out into the real world. The first obvious question is, what about the case where you're making decisions that affect many humans, not just one? Um, how do you combine preferences and so on? This is what moral philosophers have thought about for thousands of years and economists think about. Uh, political theorists think about and other people. So um, we will be bugging those people, uh, not, not for answers, of course. We understand there are no answers, but, but for help uh, in understanding uh, why these things are so difficult. I think in AI, we tend to assume that problems have, oh, that has to be a simple solution for that problem, right? You know, just, just scale everything to you know, zero to one or add them all up or you know, simple answers that turn out not to work. Um, how do we make sure that when we have billions of these machines, they don't interact in, in unexpected ways? Uh, how do we deal with the fact that in this assistance game, the human part of the game isn't playing rationally? Uh, and and un so how, how do you start learning about human preferences uh, you know, from humans who don't even express their own preferences correctly through action? Right? They do things they regret. They do things they wish they hadn't done, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, um, and then lots of practical work to turn it into real technology that, uh, that people will want to use. So let me talk a little bit about some of the questions that come up when you're deciding for many humans. Um, first of all, obvious question, uh, you know, what about the preferences of people that are different? Uh, and that's fine, right? Facebook already has about 3 billion preference models uh, for, for the 3 billion people who have been part of Facebook. Um, and so going to 8 billion is, is fine. So there's, there's no assumption here that we're putting in human values or, or whose values, right? We aren't putting in any particular set of values, simply learning to predict how each individual person uh, would like the future to be. Um, but you still have to deal with the question of trade-offs. And some, uh, some philosophers, in fact, would say it's about a third, a third, a third between utilitarians, uh, people who think about moral rights, and then people who think about virtues uh, as a way of, uh, of, of making uh, these kinds of moral decisions. Um, but certainly there, there are clear cases where it's quite difficult to figure out, you know, should you protect individual rights or should you make decisions that are best at a group level? Um, 
how do we deal with the fact that people have preferences about others? You know, most people, most philosophers argue, yeah, you know, you should not help some people hurt others just because they enjoy hurting others. Uh, that, that, you know, we should zero out the sadism part of people's preferences. Uh, but what about the fact that, that most of our preferences are relative, right? That we enjoy, you know, winning a Nobel Prize, not just because it's a million dollars, but because it says we're smarter than other people, right? It's a relative good uh, that, you know, we can't give everyone a Nobel Prize because then it would lose that relative value, right? Um, how do you put, if you're going to add people's preferences up, you know, they have to be on some commensurable scale, right? Well, how do we know uh, where, you know, some of you might actually be zombies with no internal subjective experience at all. And when we have, you know, real intelligent robots, they probably will be zombies in that sense, right? And so they, their scale of preferences is, you know, zero to zero. Uh, and, and so they won't weigh into the overall thing. But do, you know, do we all have the same internal scale? I doubt it. Um, how do we do look at aggregation over people with different beliefs? And I'll mention that in a minute. Um, and then, you know, a classical philosophy problem from the 19th century, uh, you know, when you make decisions that affect population size, right, how are you comparing those two outcomes when it isn't even the same set of people uh, who, who are going to exist? And Thanos, as you know, uh, this dude, right, says, um, you know, if if there were half as many people in the universe, the remainder would be more than twice as happy. And so he thinks he's doing a good thing by offing half the people in the universe, which he does. Um, and then sort of retires, very satisfied that he's done, he's done a good thing uh, from the point of view of utilitarianism. Uh, so Financial Times Review says, you know, Thanos gives utilitarianism a bad name, right? <laughs> um, so we don't want, uh, but the point is AI systems are going to have Thanos levels of power, and they're going to implement a solution to the population question, whether we like it or not, right? And if we don't figure it out, then whatever, you know, whatever they do by default is the solution that they're going to implement. Um, and so we had better figure it out uh, before it's too late. Just mention that uh, when, you, when you start thinking about real humans, there are enormously complicated problems about how our underlying preferences, you know, if we have them, which is not even clear uh, because of instability, because of internal conflict and so on, but to the extent that we have preferences at all, we are very poor at converting them into behavior, uh, but the machine's only evidence for what our preferences might be is, is our behavior, barring fMRI solutions. And so, um, so figuring that out is going to be very difficult. Uh, very interesting questions around uh, things like autonomy, right? In some sense, you could think of autonomy as the freedom to do what isn't in your own best interest. And, um, and so when you think through this, you, you, the conclusion that I've come to provisionally is that AI systems should not figure out how you're going to behave. Because if they do, they are going to start limiting your autonomy but if you think of it as like a freeway with off-ramps, right, they're gonna start closing off the off-ramps to make sure that you stay on the freeway, uh, which may be what you were going to do anyway, um, but uh, I would like to have the option not to do what I was going to do anyway. That's what I mean by autonomy. And so maybe AI systems have to not only refrain from constraining your behavior, but actually refrain from even predicting your behavior. Um, Nico talked a lot about this issue of plasticity of preferences, so what Nico said, um, and that's sort of a point, right? In a nutshell, that's why we want the Kavli Center, because uh, these are things we can't solve individually, uh, but maybe we can help uh, not solve, but make progress collectively. Thank you. All right, any questions, feel free to come up to the mic. We'll do a couple questions. What about having an AI that sort of adjusts the other AI? So have an AI where their objective is to reduce harm and not allow harm to like the population to sort of give feedback to the other AI that has an objective function that's different. That's a great that, that's a great question. And and yeah, so if you look at Asimov's laws you know, his first law is don't allow a human being to come to harm. Um, but uh, 
an objection to Asimov's law, and it, it, in some sense it's the dual of what I'm proposing that, you know, so if you think of harm as the opposite of payoff uh, and preferences about the future, uh, w you know, one problem with Asimov's law is you can't prevent harm, right? If, you, if I take you to the airport in a taxi, there's a probability that, you know, the bridge will collapse in an earthquake or, you know, a, a semi will crush me into the central reservation and we'll all die. Um, and so if I want to prevent harm, I have to stay in the garage, right? We, so we can't live our lives that way. We're actually constantly taking risks, even though, you know, mostly the risks are pretty small, and we learn how to make these trade-offs. Um, if you have a system, so you could have a kind of a censoring system, right? And this is actually something we do in computer science called program checking, where we don't trust that the first program we wrote actually works properly, so we have another program that's constantly watching its output to make sure that, it's, that it complies with the specifications. Uh, and uh, it's a perfectly, yeah, it's a perfectly feasible way of constructing. But what it ends up looking like, actually, is th that that composite system uh, is actually implementing an objective function that um, is either, you know, it's, it's still going to be end up uh, looking like a single objective function. So the uncertainty about human objectives is really core, and we have to, you know, that, that's the thing that gives us control, right? Hi, thank you for this inspiring talk. Um, I have a more practical question around algorithms and AI. Um, often they're already making decisions now that are pretty consequential for people if they get out on bail, child welfare, things like that. Um, and at the same time, you're not even allowed to understand what the algorithm actually is doing. And that's also true for a lot of social media companies mm -hmm. that use algorithms, but the users can't know how the algorithms actually function. And so how would you address that problem? Because that seems to be, the, to me, as a major battle because of companies claiming it's proprietary and it's part of their competitive advantage to keep the algorithm secret. But at the same time, you constantly manipulate it and you lose autonomy and agency. So how do we balance this and how can we win this battle? <laughs> uh, a great question. I, I, I actually think, you know, for consequential decisions, uh, there has to be uh, transparency. And in, um, in credit decisions, for example, this has been in, in the law for nearly 50 years. Um, and that's why for, you know, credit card uh, loans, uh, you know, extending credit limits and so on, um, you can't use neural nets. So they use decision trees and logistic regression functions, which are simple enough that you can actually decompose the features and understand the decision, and then you can see, well, I need to fix this in order, if, in order to get the loan. Um, I would argue that this is actually going to be essential. So that what, you know, the example of asking permission, right, it, it won't make sense for the AI system to ask permission if, if you have no understanding of the plan it's proposing. Right, the example I gave with the oceans is pretty simple, but it could, it could say, well, look, here's this plan, and you look at this like, what on earth is that? You know, I don't understand what it's for, what it does. It has to be able to explain it to you uh, for that process to work. So it'll be in the interest of AI systems to have the ability to explain their own reasoning. And I've been arguing, uh, actually, that we probably, you know, even if deep learning does end up working, which I think it won't, but you know, even if it does, we shouldn't necessarily uh, go that way. We, we could develop alternative technological approaches that, that do have interpretability. Uh, and I think this is something that legislation has to uh, actually address. But thank, you. thank you. That's a great question. Awesome. All right. All right. All right, so n next up we have Jody Halpern, who is a professor of bioethics, and she's going to talk to us today about uh, why we should be even thinking about teaching scientists and computer scientists about ethics. I'm going to leave that up so it doesn't do oh, the no, same no. issue. Do me a favor. Let's just, like, I just want nothing on. I'm a philosopher by, and a psychoanalytic psychiatrist, 
So my favorite thing is just to talk to you guys and not to have a slide. Ah, here we go. I often have slides. There you go. And my, uh, what Nico said. What Nico did. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think that the point of Lee's question was that I feel, in actually, a lot of my work, I love to think about big picture. Like even in gene editing, we've been involved in work on germline gene editing and how it could change the world. And so you've heard a lot of big picture today of why we're doing Kavli and the scope of our problems. Um, but what I thought would, because I'm so, first of all, I'm so excited to see so many colleagues here, people from UCSF, thanks for coming over, um, so many of our grad students and postdocs. And I was thinking, because the heart of Kavli for me is that we provide an opportunity for grad students and postdocs in their science training or in the humanities and social science training to really learn to think about ethics early on and change the world by thinking upstream. And so I wanted to give kind of a very practical talk about how important it is that you think about ethics right now in your training. Um, and this talk will really focus on just a little bit of research we did and some other findings about how much ethical reasoning is part of being a scientist and why right now. So basically, scientists, especially in the spokes that we're looking at, are increasingly involved, basic scientists, are increasingly involved in the translation of their discoveries into products. And we've heard about that. That's why my title was Compression from Bench to Bedside. People have mentioned the compression. So some of you are ready. I mean, I see grad students and postdocs already being invited to, to partner with companies. Um, this is happening in gene editing and in neuroscience. And what we see is that um, as scientists, junior scientists, and senior scientists become more and more involved in translation, they're playing brand new roles in engaging with individuals with diseases. It's going to shut down. Keep going. It, the thing's going to shut down again. OK. Just keep going. But we can't close it. We're just in I know, but you after. can't close it. Just keep going. <laughs> OK, but we okay. just have panels after. I understand. OK. All right. We're having some technical. Uh, okay, I forgot what I was saying. Um, basically, I was talking about playing brand new roles in engaging with the public. So we, what we see is scientists now meeting people with diseases and speaking at disease foundations, speaking in the media, knowing they're addressing people with diseases. We see people increasingly involved, basic scientists in fundraising. And I would say that overall, in gene editing and in neuroscience, I have a little more to say about AI later, but, but I would say at least in gene editing and neuroscience, two of our spokes, we see basic scientists becoming, as they never have before, spokespersons for cures. And I find this fascinating. I'm thinking Brad probably doesn't know this because this is before you came here. Um, Lee, I think, maybe has heard me say this. But um, all of this started for me in 2016 when um, the world was very different. The basic scientists in gene editing were not used to being spokespersons for cures. So a couple of the leading IGI scientists came and met with me because they were very concerned, because they were getting letters from people who were desperate with disease, genetic diseases and their families. And in, with real humility, the IGI scientists said to me, look, we're trained in biophysics or chemistry. This is not our training. To, what do we say? How do we honestly communicate to people without, we want them to have hope, but we want to honestly communicate to them about the likelihood of cures. And um, that was the world in 2016. That has changed very quickly around the world for gene editing scientists and neuroscientists. So we did a research study in 2018 and 19 where we studied 45 gene editing scientists. 24 of them were basic scientists. I'm talking to you about them more because that's Kavli relevant. The other were clinician scientists. And of the basic gene editing scientists around the world, by 2019, the majority of them were directly reaching out to the public as part of their role. They had become involved in working with companies, and they were going to disease foundations to speak about cures. And they had become very involved in um, really the hope that was building in society about CRISPR. And what was really interesting, we did, uh, we did at least hour-long interviews with all 45 subjects, scientists. And what we found is that they, um, first of all, described their, their 
this unprecedented historical move into translation of basic scientists and said what's happened is there's such limited public funding that the only way, and they really believe in the promise of CRISPR, and the only way to develop our science and eventually lead to medical cures is to get involved very early on with industry. Not only is that the only funding that can really take us anywhere, and we were talking earlier, you know, follow the money, that's where it is, but the NIH really didn't want to fund anybody who couldn't show that industry was interested in their product. So there's a, there was absolutely essential to get involved. And these scientists very much believed in the promise of CRISPR, and you've seen with Brad's slide how much promise has already been um, uh, 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 come true. So they felt very aware that these, this funding was pulling them into industry and that the goals of industry were pulling them into uh, roles as public spokespersons for cures. They were also, though, in their in-depth interviews with us, aware that this created some uncomfortable contradictions for them. As they were signing up, some of them were involved in first in human clinical trials or at least going to disease groups to, to promote people thinking about becoming research subjects. They were aware that that kind of speaking towards cures and getting people's hopes up was essential to how they communicated for fundraising and for getting clinical trials off the ground. And they really saw that the reason that research subjects signed up for the first in human clinical trials was because they overwhelmingly believed that they would receive a cure from being in a, in a very early research trial. But they themselves, the scientists, felt that the better reason to be in a trial that early was altruism because we know that early phase trials don't necessarily lead to cures for the initial people in the trials. So the scientists were aware of this ambiguity, ambiguity and uncomfortable about it. Um, I want to make a point here that the cause of people unrealistically believing that a phase one or early trial might give them a personal cure, the cause of that is not CRISPR. CRISPR has caused a lot of excitement for all of us because of how incredible some of these results have been, to use that language. But there's well-known research that I've been involved in. Our group did some of it. Others here have done some of it. Um, for just traditional cancer research trials before CRISPR, et cetera, that 90 to 95 percent of people who go to the NIH to be in a phase one trial go there believing that they're likely to have a cure. And yet maybe, because just to, for those of you who don't know much about clinical trials, a phase one trial is a toxicity or dosage trial of a traditional medication. So those trials have maybe one to two percent chance of giving you any improvement in your cancer. And those people, those 95 percent who go to the NIH when they have a very serious cancer to be in a trial expecting or hoping for, not just hoping, but believing that they may get a cure, I don't know if you realize this, but a lot of those people are MD-PhDs. So this is not the issue we have in healthcare of, you know, which populations even understand what's going on in research, et cetera. This is an emotional, desperate conviction. It's a cognitive distortion that happens when people are very afraid and living with very serious disease. And there's a name for it. It's called therapeutic misestimation. And therapeutic and misestimation in that you over, way overestimate how likely being a research subject, how likely it is that you'll receive a personal cure. And this is a very difficult problem in all clinical research, and it just became a problem in these innovative, highly innovative therapies as well. And we just saw that the scientists that we interviewed were very concerned about this, and they said, um, we would love to have more ethics education about how, how do we do it? How do we balance encouraging people to be in trials? Because the whole reason we're doing this is we believe we can get to cures with CRISPR, and we can't do that without clinical trials. But we also don't want to have research subjects coming into the trials with unrealistic expectations. They also, though, honestly told us, the scientists, that while they felt this eth these ethical issues, these, this conflict of obligation to serve a great societal long-run goal of fi finding a cure for future populations and the short-run goal of how they treated the people in the trials, conflict of obligation, I'll get to that. They also said that even though this is really something that we were never trained to think about, 
Um, and the training that they had, and we did a little survey at Bergen as well, the training that most of the scientists had was, as you heard earlier, in ethics was about avoiding fraud and reporting data, but they had no training in, in this human subject or, or population engagement kind of ethic. And they, they were very concerned about that, the scientists. But they also said, frankly, though, with the structure of my role and the, and the expectations, I'd rather outsource that stuff. So I'd rather have somebody else who does the ethics. And I think a lot of it was that they felt very uncomfortable with those conflicts. They seemed, it, the conflicts seemed almost intractable to them. Okay, so that's the gene editing example from our spokes because it's the one I've done research in myself, our group. But there's um, really quickly, uh, actually it's good because Jack presented some of this with neuroscience. He talked about um, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's and intractable depression. Well, that research has shown very much the same thing. And Jack even mentioned this. Um, for that, the scientists involved in that work, like Jack, why he got involved in ethics, they're facing their own discomfort and perplexity about these same sorts of ethical conflicts of obligation. And one example of that is that the studies for deep brain stipulation, when you have electrodes <laughs> implanted, and um, for, well, the one for Parkinson's worked out and the FDA approved it, the one for intractable depression at a population level, the harm-benefit ratio wasn't sufficient for the FDA to approve it. But what happened to the research subjects in those trials, again, people who signed up believing that they would get a personal benefit, even though they were told it was a clinical trial, et cetera, is that some of the people in those trials did actually have, even though overall people didn't benefit enough, some had major benefits. And if you've ever had depression, if you can imagine a lifelong of intractable depression, now you've got these deep brain stimulation function going on, and for the first time in your life, you're not, or one of the first times, you're not severely depressed. And it was working, but because it wasn't funded by the FDA, at the end of the trial, the tech support for their deep DBS was cut off. And there was no, so one of the ethics there, a, fair, a fairness and justice, um, one of the most important things there is, and this has to do with economics and access and all of that, is that um, when we have research subjects, not only do we hope that they understand why they're in a trial, but what are our post-trial obligations to them? So that's a very important example. And I'm not even going to do an AI example because you've heard a lot about AI today, but I'll just say something we all know about just from reading the newspapers, which is another area where we see AI engineers facing related conflicts of obligation is we see AI engineers who want to develop the products they're developing because it could potentially serve some maximal social outcome. But even when they're developing, they can be aware of that the product could have certain bias, risk, or even be used for human rights kinds of misuses. But they also don't have early on the ethics training to balance those conflicts of obligation between you know, just not doing something or doing something that could do a lot of aggregate good in the long run, but that has a lot of dual use or other risks in the shorter run. So I've used this term three times for the three spokes, but I'm talking to you about the phrase I use is conflicts of obligation. And I want to say that um, we're all very familiar with conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest are why you have to report if you start a company or you get a lot of income from a company, you report it at Berkeley or in other academic institutions. That's when you have personal gain, and, and we want to make sure that your personal gain is not leading you to make decisions that aren't best from an ethical standpoint. That's very familiar. It's not very, ethically cha it's not very intellectually challenging to figure it out, but it's still important to regulate. But conflicts of obligation are fundamentally intellectually challenging because what they're saying is you have two different sets of obligations. And just to talk about why that would happen all the time, which it does, a lot of people, some people are very aware, I'm looking at the philosophy department over here, but a lot of people aren't aware that there are two very distinct philosophical frameworks that affect the ethics of science and technology. One framework, which we've heard referred to, Stuart referred to these conflicts too, is utilitarianism, which is a, it's a one brand of consequentialism, but it's, it's the one where, both, let's just call it utilitarianism, where you, it's measurable outcomes that you're trying to do. You're trying to come up with a, a measurable aggregate outcome. 
And it's an outcome like improving health or decreasing infant mortality that's actually not itself morally imbued. It just has, it's a measurable world, objective, physical sort of outcome. And that is what scientists as experts, we know research shows, that's how scientists think of ethics. They think like utilitarians. That's the default mode. So when you hear scientists talk about how much good their discovery can do, how much we can do for everything, you know, people, health, the environment, um, uh, quality of life, they're thinking like utilitarians about this long-term outcome benefit, or it might not, because there's, it could happen quick these days, but it's a mass measurable outcome. And that's very important. But it's only one of two really important ethical systems. The other one, and by the way, research just came out showing that these two systems use two different parts of the brain. The other system is about where human rights and justice and fairness and all those considerations come up. And that is the system of not just the outcome and a, and a measurable good like that, but how do we treat each other along the way? How do we respect each other's rights? How do we make sure disadvantaged populations are included? That's all about how we treat each other along the way. And there's a, the, the name of that system is deontology, because until about the 19th century, people used to talk about that system in terms of duties. Ology, study of, deont is duties. And deontology, the study of duties, was sort of almost all of ethics until the 18th, 19th century. It was sort of good Samaritan ethics. And it was the idea that we all have ethics based on our responsibilities and duties. So parents have duties to their children, teachers have duties to their students, governors have duties to their state. That was ethics. Then in the 18th, 19th century, Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and others were looking at their societies in London and places that had terrible conditions. People were living in squalor and terrible conditions, poor health, and they were just they felt that the chains of duty and these traditional ways of thinking about ethics were keeping pro the world from making progress. And they said, let's think like social engineers. What if we put ourselves above society and take a look and say, what's the outcome we really want to see? What's a, a more utopian or better human life? And how can we work towards those outcomes? And so they, they were the utilitarians. And what's interesting here is you can see that by definition, the utilitarians did not want to be chained by these duties. And it turns out that by around the 18th, 19th century, duties were, were the, the language of duties was supplanted by the language of rights, which, which, which is what we are all familiar with, human rights, individual rights, because it turns out duties and rights are really the same thing. I mean, this is, the philosophers are gonna definitely wanna tell me all the ways that I'm not exactly, there, there's lots more to say about this. But where there's a right, if you have, I mean, I'm very concerned this week about women's rights over their body and their health. That's only a right because other people have a duty to respect it. Or, you know, in this case, the US national government has a duty to protect that right. So duties and rights are part of the same thing. Utilitarianism was designed to not care about duties and rights. So that's where we're at right now. So that means that we have these two different ethical frameworks and they use two different parts of the brain and scientists in their training right now are default only using utilitarianism. So they can do an, a lot of things to produce an ultimate benefit that they see as a social engineer without thinking at all about the rights of the people they're interacting with. And so the reason I wanted us to do Kavli is I want scientists early in their training to learn to think in both frameworks at once. I've been teaching ethics to, to leaders for 23 years at Berkeley at the graduate level, and some and it's public health ethics, et cetera, these issues, and the best people in my class are often scientists. You don't have to be a philosopher to be able to use both these frameworks, but you have to have training it early on because you actually have to be pushed to get out of your default framework and think in this other framework. And when you think of both, you're gonna face all these conflicts of obligation because the framework can conflict. But you can also come up with solutions. They don't have to conflict. You can come up with solutions where they constrain each other, but you can come up with uh, solutions that are not ideal, but that allow for respecting rights and producing benefit. 
And an example of that is our group at Bergen, and I'm about to end, because I see Lee looking at her watch. Um, the group that we started five years ago, Bergen, you heard what it's called, Berkeley Group for the Ethics and Regulation of Innovative Technologies. We've been meeting with scientists and philosophers and others, policy folks. We've been meeting for five years and creating an intellectual environment where people can think in both frameworks. And the most recent example, we did this series this year on climate change, and what we saw is that carbon credits that maximize aggregate car carbon sequestration often disadvantage already disadvantaged communities, and they, there's environmental injustice. And so what we thought about was how can we take that as a constraint but also still try to do the Im positive impact on the environment, and we all think together about it. And this is what I hope Cavalry will help all our grad students and junior faculty and all of us in science and technology do together. So thank you. Okay. Um, so we've got some panels up next. So while I pull the panel chairs in, if there are questions, go ahead and step up to the mic. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Anybody? Oh, great. Okay, this is a perfect tag. So um, I'm a first year PhD student in bioengineering and um, also a population geneticist. Um, but again, I'm very early. I'm a very early stage scientist in my field. And the thing is, is that my field is facing an ethical dilemma where scientists still use uh, race as a proxy for biological diversity, uh, which is proven to be incorrect. However, uh, senior scientists in the field are very opposed to figuring out another way to quantify diversity without relying on that ancient system. And whenever I talk to other, talk to these scientists, like pitching ideas, they're extremely resistant to it because they say, oh yeah, it's a necessary evil, we have to go with it. So what is your advice for like early stage scientists who want to challenge these norms, who know other scientists who are like very well known in the field, who agree with them on the fact that this needs to be changed, but no one wants to do anything about it? Well, I think, I mean, obviously there's so much um, resistance to change that's such a problem. I mean, my most cynical thing that I say is that the older folks, we all have to just die off so that the young folks can change the world. But, um, but I do think that the goal of places like Kavli or what Birgit or whatever is that there's sort of power in numbers. And it doesn't have to be large numbers, but that it's very hard to be a single spokesperson in graduate school um, and not be, I mean, there's so much power dynamics in grad school. So it's always better to have several people and, and you, so you already have these, you've already done a lot of really smart stuff. Like you knew there were, people these scientists respect who are spokespersons for getting rid of the proxy of race. And so you show them people you respect tell us to do this. But you can also get more and more grad students and folks that are involved in Kavli, et cetera, to speak about it. We've seen that. I, I'm involved in a joint medical program here at Berkeley where literally our number one agenda item now is just our, we're the only medical school in the country where our first goal is anti-racism. And that came from students changing us over time. I think we should probably go to the panel. Thank you, everybody. All right, so, so we thought what we would do, um, what we just went through was sort of a survey of the various scientific spokes in the center and some of the philosophy that will be associated. We also have partners in social sciences and we're looking for more. Um, but then we also have the axle component and that's about really reaching out into the real world. Um, we have partners in the law school, um, in school of public health, et cetera. <laughs> and so rather than giving you a short talk for every single one of those components, we thought we would put it into a panel. Um, so in merging these two, we're going to talk a little bit about the real world 
application and um, impact of some of the work that we want to do and also how we're going to bring the world into what we're doing. Um, and then also talk about more around the training and hopefully spend a lot of time answering questions. So maybe I'll have Johan start. Um, if you want to just quickly introduce yourself before you begin. Yes, hello. My name is Johan Fricht. I'm an associate professor here in the philosophy department at Berkeley. My own work is mainly in moral and political philosophy. I was supposed to be the chair of the first of our two panels, uh, which was entitled Research and Real World Impact. So as Lee says, dealing with some of the spoke um, elements, uh, the, sorry, the axle elements uh, uh, in the organizational diagram of the center. Um, we're going to try and have a conversation about uh, the role that law, public policy, uh, also public science communication can uh, play in shaping uh, our scientific futures. But at the same time, we also, of course, want to talk about the impact that advances in fields like artificial intelligence, genomics, uh, and so on, uh, can have uh, on the criminal justice system, on the conduct of public policy, and on other areas of general public concern. Um, so on, on that latter theme, let me begin by putting a question to uh, Rebecca. Um, um, so Re Rebecca has thought deeply about the, oh, perhaps I should first introduce you briefly. Uh, Rebecca is an assistant professor here at the UC Berkeley Law School, uh, working especially on questions in criminal justice. She's been thinking hard about uh, questions about data, technology, and secrecy in the criminal justice system. And so um, um, I, I wanted to ask you, Rebecca, um, could, could you tell us a little bit about the role that you expect, uh, especially advances in artificial intelligence, to play within the criminal justice system in coming years? You know, issues such as predictive policing, perhaps, or uh, the use of algorithms in making bail determina de determinations and trying to assess the risk of recidivism for a criminal suspect. Um, so what are some of the developments that you see on the horizon in that area, and what ethical issues do you think they throw up? Sure. Thank you for the question. And uh, before I answer, I want to say how exciting it is that the Kavli Center exists here at Berkeley and that you're all here to celebrate its opening, um, that there is institutional support, such eminent senior leadership that's committed to interdisciplinary work around science, technology, ethics, and public policy is extremely exciting. So thank you. Um, as Johan said, uh, introduced, AI systems are completely transforming the criminal legal system at every single stage, from policing to bail to evidence at trial to sentencing to judging to parole. And this creates huge needs. So what I want to do to take my, my brief moment of fame here in front of you all um, is to actually invite you to join us in the law school to do concrete, immediate, applied work to help solve these needs. How do you do that? Translate your academic articles on AI into off-the-shelf resources for lawyers and policymakers. There is knowledge on AI locked up in the academy. And Kavli Center's public engagement mission and the UC system's public service mission mean that we are uniquely positioned to translate this academic knowledge into as applied work. Let me give you a couple of examples and then I'll pass it off. Um, draft, model, statutes. There was an excellent question in the audience about how companies are using intellectual property laws and contract law to block auditing and contestability of AI systems that are making high impact decisions on people's lives. You scientists can write statutes or help draft statutes that explain why this is not okay. There is a statute currently presented in Congress by Representative Mark Takano from California that would prohibit the use of trade secret law to block criminal defense scrutiny of AI and other software systems used in the legal system. 
I'm going to be doing a fireside chat with Congressperson Takano on Thursday if you want to join on the Brookings website. Um, that statute also proposes standards. What should we require for quality assurance before we use AI and other software systems to make life-altering decisions in the criminal legal system? You and Kavli could be developing model standards for exactly that. Um, I'm working with Professor Rediet Abebe, um, Angela Jin, um, <laughs> Moritz Hart, uh, Ludwig, um, oh no, I forgot Ludwig's last name. And anyway, a wonderful group of, of, of collaborators right now doing an academic article, and one of the things we're doing to implement it is turning that article into a script for cross-examination questions of expert witnesses on the stand. Public defenders are faced with expert witnesses. They don't know how to cross-examine them. You know how to cross-examine them. You could draft those questions, post them publicly. You know why auditing a system matters. If we can't access the system because contract law is blocking us, you can write an affidavit explaining what you'd do with that if you got access. Sign it, post it publicly. Um, so, let's see. Oh, final thing. One of my wonderful former students, Dana Yao, at the law school, has gone off, got a big law job, doing great law practice, and on the side in her free time, she has created with her math professor partner a platform to match academic scientists, postdocs, grad students, with public defenders who need help understanding and challenging the technical evidence in their cases. It's called PD Query. PD for public defender, query. We've now brought her into the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, so this is a Berkeley affiliated project. Let's get Coffley members to sign up, volunteer your expertise, helping public defenders figure out how to challenge potentially fraudulent or unreliable AI forensic evidence in their cases. So I'm so grateful that this whole initiative exists and really excited that it has this public engagement mission and excited to help and uh, participate in uh, how to make that into a reality. Thank you so much for that really rich and um, um, stimulating answer, Rebecca. Before we go on to the next panelist, let me ask, are there any questions in the audience for Rebecca about what she's just been telling us about? Just come up to the microphone if you'd like to ask your question. Which I just took away from you. So just project your voice. Because <laughs> we weren't supposed to have so many panelists. And I'm happy to be in communication with anyone who's interested in participating in this kind of uh, applied translation of your incredible academic knowledge. Um, so Rebecca.wexler at berkeley.edu. Feel free to reach out. Okay. Could I, could I just ask what your Rebecca says? So I think you know one one of the most common in cases uh, is the compass system for uh, recommending parole or not parole. There was a big public debate about whether that system was biased or not. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are different definitions of fairness, and the company was claiming that it was fair under the definition that they were obliged to satisfy um, in order not to be sued for being a racially biased system. And, and you know, other investigators would say, no, it's biased in this other way, and so on. And, and they, they, they claimed that it's proprietary, so we can't tell you how it actually works. The people are reverse engineered it. And I think the reason that they don't want to reveal how it actually works is because it's actually a completely trivial algorithm. <laughs> uh, and you can reproduce its behavior almost exactly by looking at two features of the input and saying, well, if this feature and this feature uh, are bigger than this, then yes, otherwise no. And that's it, right? Um, and so uh, if they had just said that, right, then we could have had a much more sensible debate about whether that was a good way to make decisions uh, or not. And people could have tried it in different cases and look, in this case, it doesn't give the right answer and so on and so forth. So, um, so I, don't, I, I, I don't know that these are irresolvable questions, right? Do you, so, do you think that maybe one solution would simply be to say public agencies cannot employ uh, proprietary, non-transparent technology in making these decisions? So you don't have to avoid, uh, you know, laws about trade secrets. You just you just prevent the public agency from from buying that technology in the first place. 
Um, great. So I, I think this is a really important issue. And I actually was talking at the break. I represented a client who challenged his Compass result that was used to deny him parole after a decade mm -hmm. of having no disciplinary infractions in prison, which is an extraordinarily hard accomplishment to achieve. Um, the human being who performed his Compass survey assessment uh, provided a subjective input to question 19 on the Compass survey, saying that in that person's opinion, he did have a prison disciplinary problem. And as a result, he was ranked high risk and denied parole. Um, now, he had trouble. And what we were representing him and trying to do was appeal that decision. He had trouble because the parole system sucks and you have no rights, primarily. But secondly, because um, we didn't have information on the weight of the question 19 input factor to be able to argue that the incorrect input mattered to the output mm. in his system and decision. Mm. Um, so it's a huge, a huge problem. Now, I love Stewart's proposal. Let's just have public agencies regulate this in the procurement process by only buying open source tools. I haven't personally advocated for that position because what keeps me up at night is the idea that maybe we need some intellectual property protection to get the best quality technology into the criminal legal system. You can totally push back on that. Maybe Stuart disagrees, <laughs> and a lot of people do. But at a minimum, at a minimum, IP laws should not block criminal defense counsel and expert witnesses from accessing this information under a protective order. So my immediate gut reaction as a former public defender is um, at least let's empower those people doing direct representation in the adversary system at a minimum. I think I saw another question from the audience. Um. <laughs> yeah. This is maybe an ill-formed question, but I'll go for it. Um, so uh, additionally, sort of in, in, in the parole system, sort of the weighting of who does and doesn't get parole is ambiguous, to say the least. Um, and, and often those are built on sort of networks for higher level crimes of, of connectedness of individuals for which tracking is quite valuable. Because once someone's on parole, they lose almost all of their rights. And so you can track their data in ways that are sort of not um, available for the for the general sort of civilian public, um, and this is sort of, sort of a question from your field. But is that data available on how individual like, or is that at the level of, like beyond what um, legal experts are able to access in terms of which individuals are being computationally connected and therefore considered for continued tracking based on maybe additional other cases that overlap and therefore when they you know apply for parole because of peripheral knowledge or engagement or relationships, they are continued to be denied for the purpose of increased capability to track um, data and populations. That's fascinating. So there is a whole movement in parole and pretrial for tracking rather than incarceration. And this was a, a proposed, one of the proposed solutions to mass incarceration. And yet it has huge problems, racial biases, costs that are inflicted on people who um, are forced to pay for tracking devices. And you're raising another issue that I had not thought of, which is who gets access to the aggregated tracking data? Um, is that being locked up in the companies that are developing and selling these tools for public use? I don't know the answer. I think it's an awesome question. I will point you to my colleague in the law school, Catherine Crump, at the Samuelson clinic that does technology and criminal defense work specifically. Mm -hmm. And she has written about and focused on tracking um, in order to identify some of the civil liberties concerns around it, as well as um, the fees and fines concerns around it. And I think it'd be fantastic if you were, if you were interested in auditing that data, auditing what companies are doing with that data. Um, more broadly, all of the outsourcing and privatization of the criminal legal system functions has led to uh, exploitation of data by private companies, whether it's your um, cellular communications with your attorneys in prison or uh, something else. So I'd be very worried about it. I don't have an answer for you, but it's a great question. And we'd love to work with you on, uh, on trying to get access to that data or, or get standards for who can access it, some type of regulation on what you could do with it. Uh, great. Um, 
Let me come next to you, sure. Lee, uh, because Lee is here not just as interim executive director of the center and um, um, the MC of this event. She's also a resident expert on matters of science communication and public engagement uh, on matters of science. So let me ask you a question about that, Lee. Um, we, we often think of, uh, or tend to think of public engagement about science as something that happens essentially downstream from science, right? It's a matter of um, creating, uh, shaping public opinion, perhaps creating acceptance for new scientific tools or technologies that have already been developed. Um, but I take it you have a different vision for the role that public engagement can, can play, uh, uh, to play a more active role in the process of uh, science and t technology itself. So could you speak a little yeah, bit to sure. that vision? Yeah, so I think it's you know really at the core of trying to combine all of these things. You know, if we're, if we're trying to think about how to develop technologies and science in a way that benefits humanity um, and protects human rights, et cetera, um, and upholds the interests of people, you really have to better understand what those interests are and why and which people and how are we bettering the world and for who um, and by who and who gets to decide. So all of that you know, is somewhat in the domain of philosophy and social sciences, but it's also very much in the domain of public engagement. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, I think a, a lot of what scientists are often exposed to around public engagement is really public communication, um, which plays a huge and important role because we have a duty, going back to what Jody said, we have a duty to the public um, because most of us are publicly funded. Um, and so we do, we have a duty to communicate effectively what it is we're doing, why we're doing it. But I would argue that we also have a duty to listen to people who may stand to be either benefited or harmed by the work that we're, that we're doing um, about how they want that result to look, um, what concerns they have. And so there's, in the, you know, in the realm of uh, public participation, there's this kind of uh, standard spectrum that people talk about, that professionals talk about, where you have public participation that spans the realm from anywhere communication-esque, where it's really you're reaching out, you're trying to inform. And that has a really important role, and often it's the basis of other kinds of communication and engagement. And it goes all the way up to things that try to empower people. And those are really hard to do. And so that would be something like um, community-based participatory research, where you are actually partnering with a certain community around a topic, and that community has a say in what you do next. So that's you know, not informing, that's actually sharing decision-making power with an impacted group. And that's really hard. And then there's stuff in between. So there's things like um, worldwide views events where there's an issue um, and there's sort of a forum that's held in multiple places around the world and you try and recruit people to the forum that have a particular point of view, um, who have a particular stake and hold these discussions. And there you're really trying to map the problems. Um, and that map can then inform, but it doesn't necessarily have a decision-making power um, on the science itself. So I think what we want to do here is teach um, about these different methods, how they work and when to use them, but also implement some of them. And there's a lot of really great communication of science happening here in the Bay Area. There's also some great engagement happening, and we want to be partnering with those practitioners, because really, you know, this is a field that's driven very much by practitioners and less by academics. Um, so we're looking for practitioner uh, partners to do that, to reach out uh, to communities. And part of that is identifying who we should be reaching out to. It cannot just be a majority opinion about something. We need to think about who is disproportionately impacted. Um, often in sort of polling, there's an undervalue of the voices of minorities or of people that... Um, you know, or otherwise often um, the recipients of the harms uh, and very infrequently the recipients of the benefits. So we have to try and intentionally uh, reach out to those folks as well and engage them. So I'm going to take that as my cue to go to my panel that I'm supposed to be um, moderating. Um, so I mentioned that we, we want to do some training um, as well as some actual practice of that. 
So I wonder, uh, Stuart, if you could maybe give a little more information about the training programs, and then um, if Saul, and I, I should mention Saul is, is new to the stage here. Saul's a Nobel laureate um, and professor of physics. Um, I wonder if Saul and Jody, you could also talk a little bit about your experiences with uh, training scientists and uh, cohorts around these kind of interdisciplinary um, issues. So Stuart, if you could give a quick overview. So uh, let me say first that the graduate and postdoctoral fellowship programs are uh, still on the drawing board, meaning that uh, we're open to suggestions on how they should run uh, and very flexible. I think the default notion that we've come up with so far is that they would be 50% funded by Cavalry, and then the position would be 50% funded by a spoke discipline or uh, you know, a hub discipline if it's a philosopher or you know, someone uh, pursuing uh, you know, PhD in, in jurisprudence or whatever it might be. Um, so uh, yeah, and that suggests that many of these positions are going to be co-advised, might be between um, you know, uh, a law professor and a biologist or uh, an AI researcher and a philosopher. Um, and uh, the actual content of the person's research uh, might vary considerably. I could see someone doing, you know, really 80% biology and 20% uh, ethics, or it could be 50-50, or it could be 20-80, the other way around, that you're mainly studying uh, the philosophical questions that arise in AI, for example. Um, so we're going to be very flexible about that. Uh, what we hope, and this is partly based on the model that, that did, so um, Saul, in addition to, to being quite a good physicist, uh, <laughs> is, is director of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Um, yeah, so just, uh, this is a, a digression, but, but George Akerlof, who who's a Nobel laureate in economics, um, I invited him to, to do a speech at an event a few years ago, uh, and I was looking on his webpage just to you know, help prepare my introduction for him. And I noticed that his webpage didn't even mention his Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was so embarrassed that he simply stopped updating his webpage on the, the, you know, the, day, he, the day he learned that he got the Nobel Prize, because he didn't know what else. He didn't want to put anything on there. Uh, so he just left it. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so Saul's so director of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science and has implemented a model that uh, that actually brings people together from different disciplines where they, they have data science related problems, but different, you know, the content of the data is different, but the data science aspects of it are often shared, and, uh, and then they find that by bringing those people together, uh, there are enormous benefits from cross fertilization. So, so, uh, so this kind of collaborative problem solving across disciplines, and I gave a list earlier of the the kinds of shared uh, questions that arise across all three spokes, um, that I think will be enormously helpful. Um, we will have uh, multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary graduate courses, and I uh, taught one of those a uh, year before last, joint with um, Lara Buchak from philosophy and Shikhar Kariv from economics, looking at questions of you know, rationality, preferences, uh, decision-making on behalf of multiple individuals, so social aggregation. Oh, and, and uh, Wesley Holliday, uh, who's uh, from philosophy and logic and methodology of science. So it was really an amazing experience. Unfortunately, it was interrupted by COVID. So we went from having, you know, fascinating, fermenting kinds of uh, classroom discussions uh, to you know, if to early experience with Zoom and how deadening uh, that can be for, for that kind of interaction. So that was, that was unfortunate. But otherwise, it was a, a really wonderful experience. So I'm looking forward to doing that again. Um, and, uh, you know, we will try to raise as much money as we can uh, to fund as many of these fellowships uh, as possible. Yeah, great. So speaking of courses, I wonder, Saul, if you could talk a little bit about your course and how that has influenced your thinking um, and sort of how it, it connects with with this center. Uh, 
good uh, good afternoon, everybody. Now, um, I, I'll just say that uh, the, the course that, um, that actually Johan and I um, have been participating in, also with, together with um, Alison Gopnik from uh, Social Psychology of uh, Child Development, uh, is called Sense and Sensibility in Science. And it was a, I think, a very good example of what you're de you're describing, those two of, of these uh, of courses, where you get conversations between completely different disciplines, um, thinking about topics that actually, in this case, uh, touch a lot on the topics we're talking about today down here. Because, uh, for example, you know, we we're describing uh, how you get um, you know, uh, public participation in ethical you know, science issues. One of the you know, parts of the course that we we uh, spend a lot of time on is how do you have public be able to deliberate on uh, decisions that they need to make as a society or as individuals uh, that do depend on scientific input. And I, and I realized that as we were just uh, talking just now about the duties that we have towards engaging the public in these, in some sense it's also a uh, utilitarian goal because I think that uh, we've seen that right now uh, we have a real trouble in our society with people being able to think together rationally and feel that there's a legitimacy in the uh, in the scientists' recommendations and or the scientists, you know, uh, you know CDC or, or uh, other, uh, you know, in the pandemics have been very obvious. Yeah. So um, one, one of the uh, topics that comes up in our course a lot is this topic of can you get a system working where people are able to begin to separate the values that are in play from the scientific facts, you know, that have been established or the probabilities that have been established so that um, you're appropriately using the public to think through how would they want to prioritize the values and, and the uh, goals and the fears that go into a decision. It's not, you know, most of these recommendations are not, in fact, a cold scientific recommendation. And the scientists shouldn't be pretending that it's just follow the science. They should be separating out you know, which parts are science that we've so far understood, which parts are science that we're still going to try to figure out, but which parts are actually rankings of values that the public has as much right as anybody, and in fact more right in some sense, to um, help establish. And you want them to feel that there's a legitimacy in how those were, were determined. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I see it as a, a real opportunity uh, that we've been discussing in a course like ours, um, both for education, that you can you know, imagine many courses that would be able to you know, do these kinds of conversations, yeah. but also one of the practical elements of the, uh, of the center. Like, Right. Started. So there's multiple. What I'm hearing you say also is that public engagement has many reasons, right? That it's it's to inform outwardly, to inform inwardly, and hopefully to also help scientists think about which direction, because we're always presented with p multiple possibilities of where our science could go, um, and getting some information about which one of those paths do we want to pursue. Um, is help, important it helps in terms of legitimacy. and it helps in terms of you know the public trust of science which I think many scientists are um, lamenting is seemingly declining and um, I was going to add just one other thought um, about uh, Stuart's comment about the use of the, uh, the possibility of the cohorts uh, that come to a center like ours that would have both um, you know advanced grad students and postdocs working together is that when, uh, when, when Jody was commenting before that sometimes you feel you need to wait for the previous generation to die off, <laughs> um, a, a much more humane way to do it is, is uh, when, when the cohorts uh, start working together, uh, we found, for example, in the, uh, in the data science um, situation, is that they begin to develop their own uh, group culture, and they, uh, they've actually been often the ones who help um, sort of fight for the next steps forward you know, in data science, they have to do with replicability and good practices of open, of, you know, of open science and open software. Um, and they would be, they would eventually start developing approaches to it. And they wrote, you know, these uh, best practices casebook uh, as as a cohort, and that got published. Huh. And uh, and so you can actually see them as potentially you know, becoming the leaders in that next generation of how do we think about these sorts of science and ethics problems. And yeah. what we love with is, uh, you know, if anybody has ideas uh, for uh, ways in which they can experiment, that they, you know, it would be great if they were the ones who said, well, we'd like to try out this model of, of, uh, of public engagement. Mm -hmm. and, and in principle, we, you know, we would we try to help make it possible for them to actually practice and experiment, and then they would be the ones who would be you know, spokespeople for it in the future as they head off to all the different parts of the world where they will become uh, you know, leaders in the, in the field. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to actually use that as a transition to Jody before I throw it back to you, Johan. Um, so Saul mentioned sort of the, 
the fact that young scientists and young scholars are often leaders in these areas and really pushing the boundaries. I know you've experienced some of that as well um, and how that plays out with sort of a, a long-term cohort. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Yeah, just building on what, what, oh, just yeah. building on what Saul was just saying, um, this is really our secret plan with Cadley. It really wasn't that we would have to die immediately. <laughs> we did notice, thank God for Rebecca. Well, actually, and, and we have two young in some side. But the core planning committee were a little bit on, on, at least, on the older end. Yeah. yeah. But we had about five of us who are not super young anymore. Um, but anyway, um, what, what our, our, our secret plan, I'm sorry, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. Anyway, yes. I've insulted, I've insulted everyone. <laughs> 60s and new 30s. 60s and new 30s. Yeah, We're yeah. all the same exact age, actually. <laughs> um, the, 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 the plan really is to create a cohort model, which by which we mean, first of all, just to be very logistics-wise, and, and, and Stuart's right, we do have to fundraise to make this possible. We're hoping by five years from now, we'll have about 40 folks who have already gone through. But we're starting, we're only going to start with a few next year, because we're just getting our act together. Um, um, but we basically want to build up quickly for the year after that and the year after that. And the goal would be to have a cohort of graduate students and postdocs who do 50% time interdisciplinary work. But the key thing is, on the one hand, your own work will be dual mentored, as Stuart was saying, so you could be in you know, biology and law or whatever. But the key is what was very successful in bids um, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, which is Saul's Institute, it's been very successful for people to work together. And I've been involved in my lifetime in two things like that, Greenwall, which changed the whole field of bioethics doing that, and something called the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry. Both those fields, they have people who meet together year after year after year for decades, and they change the field. They are the, the progress of the field. And we want to create this kind of cohort model. So if you are interested as a grad student or postdoc in working with us, it's not just you know, that you'll get some funding to work across disciplines, but we want you to be part of a group where the group learn from each other and take the mantle. And that's really what the goal, we have, the goal that we have. So I'm sure that hearing Stuart and Saul and Jody talk about the center has whetted your appetite for future engagement and aroused your curiosity about what, what exactly it is that we'll be getting up to in the center. So if there are any questions from the audience about uh, ways in which you could get engaged uh, with the work of the center, we'd be very happy to take a few questions. Um, oh, that's not my exact question, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Only those questions left. <laughs> I'm curious, so as graduate students and postdocs explore these ethical topics, is Cavalry Center going to make any authoritative stances? Like, mm. solutions will be generated or proposed. Will you advocate for any of them? I guess what I'm asking is, is this going to be a research consortium or more like a think tank where we have an opinion and we think this is the way we mm. should move forward? Or just, we've thought about all these things, you can read these papers. Uh, I think that's a great that, that's a great question. Um, and in some sense, you know, by writing a paper, you are saying, well, look, here's a solution. You're throwing it into the public domain and saying, you know, this is this is our thinking so far. It's not authoritative, right? We don't claim any right that because we came up with this answer, we have the right to implement it and so on. But we're putting it into the public sphere. Other people could put other answers into the public sphere, and that's how things are supposed to work. Right? No one has authority to implement, uh, you know, except what comes from you know the democratic process, which which we aren't elected uh, in that process. Um, but what I what I've noticed over the years, you know, and as I've uh, become uh, enmeshed in in these questions of policy, uh, is that contrary to my initial expectations. There is, there are no grown-ups, right? We all sort of like to think that somewhere there's a room where the grown-ups who actually understand these questions and are wise and experienced and have thought through all the issues, you know, and, and they're, they're sort of, they're looking after things and making sure bad stuff doesn't happen. They don't exist. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think that the, the 
fellows who participate in this program will, will get is uh, essentially uh, some ability to actually stand up, right? When, when questions arise, when there are things that matter in the world, you can either sit down and let someone else do it, or you can stand up. And leadership, in my view, simply means the willingness to stand up. And, um, you know, I think what, what the fellows will gain from this process is the, the willingness and the ability to stand up. And so uh, it might take some time away from your bench biology or your, you know, building your AI system, but I think you will be in a far better position to become a leader in your field uh, because this experience will, will enable you to stand up. Uh, and I hope that's what happens. So I think this is a really, it's a really important question, I think, to, uh, to understand how things actually work. The lack of grown-ups is a shock. <laughs> is there anyone else who'd like to stand up and ask? <laughs> I will add maybe to, to Stuart's answer that I think part of, part of the axle component, we, we like our metaphor here, um, <laughs> is about connecting with the real world. And so that's through partnerships with, you know, the public policy um, school and with the law school. Um, unfortunately, Elena couldn't be here. She's in School of Journalism. Um, so I think we, we will be presented with opportunities um, to inform policy. And I think how that plays out is, you know, very much going to be informed by who is in the center and what their interests are and how, how it's moving forward. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, as a follow-up to that, um, do, do you ever see this center, you know, actively engaging in, uh, like, lobbying efforts or uh, consulting efforts for government organizations, or is it, uh, you know, just like a think tank that encourages its uh, trainees to go on and do that kind of stuff? So, so technically, lobbying we're not allowed to do. It's against the law for us to lobby in the sense of trying to influence legislators on particular uh, questions of legislation. Um, but I think we pretty much ignore that <laughs> altogether. Uh, no, I think Berkeley has a long tradition of, of actually advocating for what we think is the right, the right thing. Um, and, and absolutely, uh, we're, you know, so Achai, uh, Center for Human Compatible AI, we're consulted all the time you know, I spent a long time with the EU, the people who were drafting the EU legislation, trying to get rid of the, the most egregiously terrible parts of it. Uh, I mean, you know, just to give you an example of how bad things could be, the EU Parliament actually held a debate on enshrining Asimov's laws of robotics in legislation, like, literally, putting them directly into law as stated in his 1942 science fiction story, which he admits was only written in order to produce, right, the laws were only written in order to produce interesting plots, right? So they deliberately had loopholes and weirdnesses and conflicts and so on, so that he could generate interesting stories. So that tells you how bad things can get uh, if, if you don't have expert. Uh, well, we should point out, of course, that we wouldn't uh, expect that we'll all necessarily come to the exact same conclusion within a center raising. I don't think we'll come up with a party line for here is you know, the Catholic position on this, you know, X or Y. Yeah. Um, I, I think it would be very unlikely, it would be more likely that we'll have a whole cohort of people who will become excellent advisors and participants in the, uh, political, the political process. I want to jump in as a, as a junior on this panel and, and echo <laughs> Stuart's point that you can um, uh, just, just stand up. Um, so if you, right now, draft a standard write an affidavit, write a cross-examination script, draft a statute, uh, offer yourself as a consultant to legislative staffers, you will start to have that influence. Uh, and you don't actually need to wait. You could just do it right now. Yeah, so I think maybe part of our job in the center is to support you and to give you the tools. Um, that's part of the training, right? That's how you make some connections. Yeah. So I think maybe maybe you don't know how to draft the, legisl the, the legislation, but Rebecca might. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the people that are writing it in Congress are like 22. Yeah. So so that you know bar to entry should be pretty low.
Well, and they work for they work for Exxon. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Good point. They're not even in Congress. Yeah. And, and actually, uh, that is such a one of the things that I'm so excited about about the Kavli Center is opportunity for the academy to balance out some of the influences of industry in these public policy spaces. Yeah. So it it maybe is worth quoting. Paul Berg. So in the proposal, we have this quotation from Paul Berg. So for those of you who don't know, he was one of the main developers of uh, you know, genetic engineering, like the competent DNA technology. Um, and they held a workshop in 1975 called the Asilomar Workshop, which is very famous in the history of the development of regulation of, of gene technologies. And um, in 2008, he wrote a retrospective on that, uh, which appeared in Science, um, and I'm not going to remember the whole quote, but basically says, uh, you know, the only way to effectively uh, make decisions about emerging technologies and scientific capabilities is for scientists and publicly funded institutions to make common cause with the general public. If we wait until commercial interests and, and commercial scientists dominate the conversation, it will be too late, right? And and that I think is uh, that's a pretty wise observation from someone who looked at, you know, was looking back on this after 40 years of experience with how things turned out. Hmm. Any other questions out there? So thank you, Johan, for running the mic. <laughs> so is there? Do you pay attention of not only our, uh, um diverse of uh, disciplines, but also different background of the country or race or other stuff or diversity? Absolutely. Um, do, go ahead. And wow, how? I like to yeah. Do you want to? It's so uh, funny, though, because I'm being given the mic. <laughs> I don't know. I don't I, wasn't sure who it was okay. correct, too. Well, I mean, the whole entire time we were working on the proposal, it's been a huge concern of mine, and I think of all of ours. Um, I feel like we're actually a little bit old and white, um, and, and, and uh, I've actually told a lot of people that. Um, we didn't want to drop out, but we tried um, to sort of... I believe, and we've put it in a, as a commitment, I think, from all of us, that in recruiting our postdocs, first of all, faculty-wise, we're looking, we're going to create a, a broader, so I, 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 there's, we've talked a lot about public participation, but we are, I mean, we are an academic institution, and one of the things that we do want to do is just build much more, we've talked about cross-department, but we want to reach out to many more faculty, staff, and others besides students across Berkeley, just UC Berkeley, um, very much to, to achieve much more diversity in who's included. But then I think a priority, because, you know, follow the money, is that whatever money we can raise to get postdocs and grad students, I do feel that it's very important to try to get more underrepresented folks up into the pipeline that way. So I do think that that's a very important priority. Um, I don't know if other people yeah. want to say this. I'll, I'll hop in. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question. and. You know, it, it goes a little bit to what I was mentioning earlier about how you do engagement and with who and why. Um, I think you're, what you're pointing out is that it, it has to be intentional, right? It can't just be a opinion poll about a topic and if the majority of the people that answer happen to be white in U.S. of a certain economic background, then that's the answer. It can't be that. Um, so we have to be intentional about in the US, but also abroad, because I think every part of uh, all the spokes, um, the scientific disciplines here are international issues, right? We, we're here in Berkeley, our you know, partners are in Berkeley, but the issues are international. And so we do have to have an intentional approach that doesn't just look here in our own backyard, Maybe we're partnering with people here and abroad. Um, and I think a lot of that also is really thinking, putting intention behind how you're thinking about who might need to have more of a say and why. Yeah, just, just a little follow-up on that question, right? So, so there are many issues um, 
we talked a little bit about fairness and the fact that there are multiple mathematical definitions of fairness that people in the machine learning community have have developed and, and then tr now trying to understand, well, when do you use which one and blah, blah, blah. But other issues, uh, for example, what does it mean for a data set to be representative? And this is something that uh, the Institute for Data Science is struggling with uh, and the field is struggling with because, um, you know, and we haven't even, I would say, begun to give good answers to that, that question. Right? So let me give you a simple example. Um, you might say, okay, well, if you're doing data sets for, for medical prognosis or, or diagnosis or whatever, um, you, know, you should have representation of both male and female uh, possible you know, potential patients in the data set. Um, and maybe there should be equal representation. But you know, what if you're trying to predict problems in pregnancy? Well, it doesn't make sense to have male patients in the data set at all, right? Uh, so you'd have only females. Right? But what if pregnancy turns out to very rarely, but sometimes occur in males? Uh, and which in some sense, it actually can. Uh, or you know, I guess it's really because, in fact, male-female isn't a dichotomy anyway. Um, well, you know, it's very rare. Does that well? And then, what fraction of males should be in the data set? Should it be back to 50-50? Well, we don't have an answer to that question, right? Um, and we see similar questions around data sets for for skin cancer. So there are um, seven, I think, types of skin according to dermatologists. You know, ranked uh, basically seven categories depending on how susceptible you are. To uh, solar radiation, um, and so some people argue, oh well, then we need to have equal numbers of people in each of these categories, right? But obviously, you know, you might take type six and, and you know decompose it into type six A and six B, and now what well, do we need equal numbers in six A and six B as well as all the others? And so that's clearly not a good answer, right? So so all the sort of you know default answers that people propose to these questions seem to have flaws, and I think this is a case where, uh, again, uh, once again, we need the philosophers uh, and ethicists to kind of help out the data scientists and AI researchers uh, in order to even understand what appears on the surface to be a very simple question. And coming back to the, the point made earlier, you know, that racial categories are such a uh, anti-diluvian way of answering these questions. Um, and uh, it, it has, I think the answers have to be, you know, what good is the data? What it, what is it for? You know, who will benefit from the data? How much how much benefit is going to accrue to whom from adding one more data point of what kind to the data set? And, and maybe that's the direction we could go. Um, one of the major problems we have with uh, is ethnocentrism, white supremacy, a lot of social and cultural biases that affect what we study, what we do, what's a problem, what the yeah. problems are. Will there be an ongoing, like you were saying, two AIs? Will there be an ongoing reflection of and cr critique in a, in a positive way of how our basic premises, um, prejudices of class, race, and so on enter into how these questions are approached. Yeah. I think that needs to be sort of an ongoing, reflexive um, process. Yeah, absolutely. I, yes, is the short answer. You're, you're hitting the nail on the head. And I think when we, when we think about what are the questions that we need to engage about and with who, we are also exerting biases about what those questions are that we identified. So it's... It's both about making sure that we are overrepresenting people that stand to be disproportionately impacted, but it's also about how do you inform which questions we need to engage about or which questions we need to be, you know, interacting with our philosopher friends and our ethicists and our lawyers about in the first place. And so, yes, it has to be an ongoing, um, not just engagement about a specific question, but about what are the questions that we should be asking in the first place. This isn't inspirational, but I just want to make an operational observation. Yeah. 
for you guys, which is that when you say you're listening, you want to be able to have cross disciplinary graduate courses. Um, <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> you want to institutionalize this a little bit. I want to suggest the what half day conferences that there's an issue with how do you incentivize teaching time yes. for your instructors, uh, and how do you how do you uh, apportion credit for your student participants. So these are these are issues that so I'm speaking from experience. So you know, so I, I did this 15 years ago. We set up the, the Nano Sciences Institute, and we had a fantastic first round or two when we put together our courses. The VIA uh, and our new faculty hire, but then the issue, of especially people who are pre-tenure, is how do you apportion your teaching time? And if you're an institute rather than a department, you have a very hard time apportioning people's teaching time. So there's so there's little complications of figuring out how you actually uh, get the institution's cooperation of for people's time and credit. I'll answer that maybe. Um, yes, you're absolutely right, and we are in the middle of a conversation about that um, for our participating faculty. How can we enable them to participate? Because you know especially at a place like Berkeley, I think there's very narrow criteria by which you're evaluated as a faculty member and as a graduate student. You know, you come in, we are not a graduate program. Maybe someday we will be, but we are not. Um, and so you, as a graduate student, have criteria in your graduate program that you got hired into. Um, you still have to meet that criteria. So yes, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle for sure. Um, I hate to say it, but a lot of it is money. And we do have some money budgeted. Um, part of the reason that we made these fellows um, was because we wanted to actually pay them um, and that that would be a, a way that they could go to their existing PIs and say, you know, I want to be a part of this. I want to spend a certain percentage of my time on these issues. And you don't have to cover my time while I'm doing that. You know, don't bother using your graduate uh, your grants for my time while I'm doing something that's not part of your grant, I have this other funding. And so that's, I think, really enabling. Um, and we're thinking about other ways to enable faculty. Um, postdocs are a little different. But yeah, it's a challenge. And I, I think any center like this faces that challenge. But we do kind of have, I think, lofty goals. <laughs> I just want to throw in one other example of where we had a similar uh, problem with the data science uh, field when we started the Berkeley Institute of Data Science, where the, uh, from the point of view of the career path for, you know, to go to faculty positions, in the beginning, the, uh, we found that our cohort that we were producing, um, they would basically hide the fact that they had done data science um, specifically as a, as a side work, um, and they would have to sell themselves as you know, a nuclear engineer or a geophysicist or, you know, or a social scientist. Um, but over the course of the time, the society um, and the academic world had changed. And so after the first few years, it became one of the best selling points that they uh, that everybody wanted to hire a faculty member who could do both this and that. And yeah. we're hoping that we will see that that will be you know, part of the movement towards uh, creating that change so that in a few years when a postdoc grad students go out for faculty positions, um, one of the things that will be looked for is do you, can you show um, evidence that you've worked in these kinds of areas? Yeah, we, so at Chai, we had the same experience. Right? People worried that working on AI safety as opposed to AI capability would be a liability on the job market. And uh, you know, we had foundations approaching us saying, you know, we, we want to give you money, how do you solve this problem? So our first three graduates got hired at Princeton, Stanford, and MIT as faculty members uh, immediately mm -hmm. after their PhD. So it doesn't seem like in practice it's a liability because it's as Saul says, actually, departments are looking to have these kinds of people. Uh, and I think the same is going to happen in biology and uh, in climate uh, and so on. And that maybe the best way to institutionalize for course building later, if, if there are faculty in these departments who say, actually, I would like to be teaching in the department in these, in these areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's, there's a, there might be a misunderstanding because, you know, what I, I happened to be chair of the budget committee. Um, and so I processed about 1,200 academic personnel cases 
Uh, and I can assure you that someone who goes outside the department to collaborate with others to, to create a new uh, cross-disciplinary course is, is going to be rewarded and not penalized in that process. So I think the, the remaining issue comes down to the bean counting within departments. Um, and it's enormously uh, varied across the campus how that's done. Some departments, the chairman just says, you, you, and you do this, this, and this. Um, in some departments, uh, the you know, faculty member just teaches the, the same course every year, and they couldn't care less what the department chair says, they're going to just teach it. Um, some departments just count courses, like you have to teach three courses a year. Uh, in EECS, where I am, it's, there's a complicated workload formula with, with constant terms, linear terms, and even kind of logarithmic terms, which means that when you teach a big course, you get more teaching credit. You know, when you teach a small graduate course, you get less, but it's not, it's not linear. So in the sense that if, if, if three of you teach a new graduate course, you get more than a third of the credit because uh, it's, thought, it's understood that it's more than a third of the work when you, when you co-create and co-teach a course. And so the course I taught with the philosophers and economists, I got maybe, even though there were four of us, I got about half a course worth of, of credit for doing that. So this kind of flexibility um, is something that I would encourage. So we, we do need to, I think, try to spread that understanding of how you can have flexibility and still fulfill all of, all of your curricular needs within a unit. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna take that as the conclusion of our combined panel. Um, thank you all for coming and for being patient with us with our, our time. Um, I am gonna go ahead and just close out the session so that we can all get to the food. Um, we have tables and uh, drinks and food and some high tops, everything outside. Um, it's looking decent weather. Um, so as we mentioned, you know, we're really, we're building this and we want to be responsive and collaborative and we want to hear what you all want um, and we want to be partners with you. So contact us. Um, there's information in the pamphlet. Sign up for alerts for the fellowship um, application when it comes out soon um, and reach out if you have projects that you want to collaborate on. We're, we're eager to do that. So thank you all for coming today and um, go enjoy the food. Thank you.